called as inquisitive uh, it is ifix network quiz has been designed by swapnil kenny and his team it is uh, the aim of this quiz is not to just know how much the delegates have learned but also to know how much we have talked and uh, there were six questions in the first introduction round and i would uh, request swapnil uh, to take us through that i'm going to spotlight swapnil swapnil please take us through the quiz questions so very good evening to all the delegates uh, wonderful to have you guys here and before we start the next session it is so important to look at the feedback not only from the perspective of what you have understood but also from the point of view of what we have taught you and whether we have been successful in passing the message to you so let's come to the first question the first question was the stages of bone fracture healing include all except and uh, quite a few of you have have given the right answers uh, the right answer was hypertrophy of bone edge which is not a part of healing but it is actually a early sign of non union hypertrophic non union the second question was how would you manage this child manage. this is a 6 year old child with a proximal humerus fracture and uh, the answer to this was a and b it was not only a so strapping and sling is correct which almost uh, 59% of you said but close reduction and spica is also another option which you can look at which about 23% of you got it right the third is this lesion what lesion is this and here almost 70% of you got right this is actually not any sort of a fracture but this is actually a poland's hump which is a combination of the distal metaphysis of the tibia the next question was about remodeling whether everything about remodeling of fractures in children in kare is correct except for and almost 73% of you got this one right which is 25% occurs at the physis and 75% occurs at by bone drift in fact it is the other way around most of the remodeling happens around or near the physis the fifth question was about overgrowth after fracture shaft fever in children everything is correct except and almost 50% of you got it right but then 50% of you got it wrong as well so the ones who got it right were correct in saying that everything is true except that it occurs maximally in the lower femur because it doesn't it it occurs mainly into the diaphysis and the upper femur which is the correct answer and the last question which almost 70% of you got it right which is the appearance of the epiphysis of the lateral epicondyle occurs up, appears at what age and 70% of you said that it appears at the age of 12 years so we have a response where about 50 to 70% of you are answering to us correctly but at the end of this quiz and at the end of this conference we would want almost all of you all to get the right answers this is all i have to share for today and i would now uh, pass on the proceedings to dr taran so thanks swapnil for uh, okay so am i audible to everybody yes sir volume is slightly low taran premal can you hear me yes, yes we can hear you so so still we have on 7 minutes to go so plan that was really quick today is a very special day Uh, because i fix is all about teaching and learning and today happens to be teachers day and uh, it's a very auspicious day to start this conference because it's all about uh, you know caring teaching and we are very happy to say that today we have more than 400 delegates who have 
registered for this conference and this has happened from all corners of the world from india to uh, the asian countries to african countries to middle east countries to european countries to few delegates from usa and it's a global phenomenon uh, we are very on a on a note how this ifix started you know uh, we will talk about this at end of the meeting but i also want to say that uh, there was a teacher and his name was joy patankar he was a teacher to me premal and sandeep and today also happens to be his death anniversary and joy was all about living uh, uh, and teaching and uh, sort of his spirit we are carrying on in terms of this meeting call i fix uh, as we come to beginning of, of this conference and and actually starting this meeting today i would request uh, dr jamal ashraf uh, to say a few words is secretary of uh, hr pacific orthopedic association and he is the one who is uh, instrumentally bringing minds together globally the orthopedic minds together joining hearts together so i would uh, request amal jamal to just unmute yourself and say hi to everybody you know something from few lines from your heart so that we can get going for this meeting well to all my friends of the apua who are incidentally guests today A warm welcome on behalf of the Indian Orthopedic Fraternity, especially the pe uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Group, and uh, I'm sure uh, the Indian faculty is aware with, of the pediatric acumen of all the guests that we have today. But since I happen to know a little bit about them besides their orthopedics, so I would just give you one line each about them. Professor Soik is. besides being a pediatric orthopedic surgeon he's a globe trotter so if you ever want to find him you have to find him in which country he is he is in and then you can actually get to talk or meet to him uh james a very dear friend is primarily an orthopedic surgeon by default but he is an sports enthusiast and he's mad about the arsenal football club too bad they most of the time they lose Evelyn is a highly accomplished uh flute player uh, sorry uh flute player and she plays for the Doc World Doctors Orchestra incidentally TJ also plays for the World's Doctor Orchestra and he plays the clarinet what you also don't know about TJ is he is a highly accomplished photographer and if you want to see deadly photographs send him a facebook request and once in a while he will bless you with one photograph like the one that came today so all of you welcome and i'm sure you will have a stimulating session and teach not only the indian young surgeons but the surgeons across the asia pacific region thank you thank you jamal now i want to invite uh, and hand over to premal who is moderator of this session along with james sui premal uh, all over to you thank you taran uh, as you pointed out today is a very auspicious day of uh, uh, teachers day and we are happy to have this session and i would say that uh, like a policy of our prime minister we are also going the neighbors first and we have all the neighbors as a panelist today exclusive asian faculty and it is uh, very heartening for me to introduce each of them so i'll start with uh, my friend professor james hui who was uh, junior lecturer when i was a fellow at uh, nus so now currently professor james huey is a professor and chair at the department of orthopedic surgery yu lung sin school of medicine and national university hospital of singapore he is head in a senior consultant department of orthopedic surgery university orthopedics hand and reconstructive microsurgery cluster at uh, national university health system singapore is area of special interest as we have already learned from dr jamal are orthopedics and many more than orthopedics but he has great interest in publications on uh, cartilage uh, grafting as well as patello femoral problems in young athletes dr cho wang is from hong kong he is a consultant and chief division of pediatric orthopedics at the duchess of kent children's hospital and queen mary hospital at the university of hong kong his area of special interest include limb lengthening and deformity correction as well as he has got a fantastic gait lab and he is interested uh, in running the show there professor tejun cho 
as we have already learned, is, is a great person. Along with that, he is a professor and chair at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Seoul National University uh, College of Medicine, Seoul National University Hospital. He's, he heads the Division of Pediatric Orthopedic at Seoul National University Children's Hospital. He is a president of Korean Pediatric Orthopedic Society, vice president of Asia Pacific Pediatric Orthopedic Society. He is a member of International Pediatric Orthopedic Think Tank. And his area of special interest include DDH, genetic and metabolic bone disorders, and limb reconstructions. Professor Saw Aik, who's a world trotter but belongs to Malaysia, is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon, consultant limb lengthening and reconstruction surgery, University of Malaya Medical Center, Malaysia. He's also secretary of ASEAN Pediatric Orthopedic Society. He's a chief editor of Malaysian Orthopedic Journal. He's a council member of ASEAN Orthopedic Association past president of Malaysian Orthopedic Association and past president of Asia Pacific Pediatric Orthopedic Society. Evelyn Kung, again from Hong Kong. She is an honorary clinical assistant professor at Duchess of Kent Hospital in Queen Mary Hospital, Hong Kong. She is the president of Pediatric Orthopedic Chapter of Hong Kong Orthopedic Society, with special interest in pediatric hip and diplomatic correction and neuromuscular disorders. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon from, um, from Ahmedabad. And I'm attached to National Municipal Medical College, and I run my hospital, uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital, and I'm a member of I'm a Team IFEX. My friend, Dr. P.N. Gupta, is a professor of orthopedics at Government Medical College, Chandigarh, India, with special interest in pediatric hip, deformity correction, and pediatric infections. My another friend, Dr. Atul Bhaskar, is a very well-trained pediatric orthopedic surgeon. He's a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon from at Surya Child Care, Bombay Hospital, and Iran Andani Hospital. He's also an honorary consultant at uh, Cooper Hospital, Mumbai. Kirti Ramdani is my colleague, uh, practices two hours away from me at Baroda, um, Gujarat. He's a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Aniba Pediatric Orthopedic Center. He's trained at DSMC, South Korea, and with Taral. And he is also a fellow of Elizabeth Asami, Italy, and Sifi. Unfortunately, he will not be able to join us because he had some prior commitments. Avisha from Mumbai is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon at SRCC and he has a fellowship training in pediatric orthopedics at Sheffield as well as BJ Vardia Children's Hospital. Ankita Bansal, again from Mumbai, she had a fellowship at pediatric orthopedics at BJ Vardia and SRCC Children's Hospital. And last not but the least, Dr. Jamal Ashraf has already addressed us, who is the APOA Secretary General of India and practices as an orthopedic surgeon and director at the Ujala Medical Center, Lucknow. As is, as is our tradition at IFIX, without wasting any time, I will hand over uh, the show for the next hour to my friend, Dr. James Hui. And James will invite the first speaker of the ASEAN faculty. Um, may I hand over to you, James, please? Hi, hi, yeah. Welcome, everyone. Um, actually, it's an Asian faculty, not ASEAN. ASEAN meaning only me and saw it, you know, the Malaysian and the Singaporean. So this one actually cover, you know, Koreans, Hong Kong, and Northern, Northern uh, Asians. So first speaker, as you know, uh, would be uh, um, Professor TJ Cho. And uh, Prima already introduced him. So I, I will get him to start off with our classification and pronunciations. TJ, are you okay to go? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. It is my great pleasure to participate in the 2020 IFICS web conference. First of all, I'd like to... Uh, it does not go forward. Just a moment. Sir, please click on the slide. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Share, share screen again. Okay. Yeah. Use your mm -hmm. mouse to click on the slide. Use your mouse. Mm -hmm. Click on the. Slide. Just click on the. Just uh, share your screen again. Then we'll guide you. Yes. Just Bottom of your screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he'll have to come out of his PowerPoint and then mm -hmm. share screen. Thank you. 
where it is. Can you see? Yes. Uh, yeah. It does not you make it full screen, sir. Yeah. Absolutely fine. Now click. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Fine. Yeah, you're ready to go, sir. Yeah, make it full screen. Okay. Yeah. The first of all, I'd like to talk about the origin of growth plate during embryonal development. Long bones are made from cartilage model where primary and secondary ossification centers develop and make bone tissue by endochondral ossification. The growth plate is a remaining cartilaginous tissue between the primary and secondary ossification centers in which endochondral ossification continues until skeletal maturity. The growth plate is composed of chondrocyte columns in zonal pattern, resting cells, proliferating cells, hypertrophic cells. Hypertrophic chondrocytes undergo calcification, apoptosis, and is replaced by primary spongiosa. When sustained physial injury, a breakage develops through hypertrophic zone at the junction of the calcified cash, and uncalcified parts, which is the weakest zone. The growing chondrocytes remain at the epiphyseal side, theoretically undamaged. It means that if the breakage takes place clearly at this zone, the growing potential of physis will be maintained. Then why does physial arrest happen in some cases of physial injury? Here, I'd like to stress that we have to differentiate two terms, physial injury and physial arrest. Physial injury is a traumatic condition that involves the physis. On the other hand, physical arrest is a condition in which a whole or certain part of the physis lost its growing capability as sequelae of physical injury. So not all the physical injuries result in physical arrest. There are several mechanisms causing physical arrest. First, the metaphyseal beak may crush the physis, as in the figures, during the injury or during reduction procedure. Second, uh, the physis is not a flat structure three-dimensionally, but it has undulations. So the growing chondrocytes can be crushed by this undulation during displacement. It happens commonly at the distal femur. Third, the physis can be crushed vertically by compression force, resulting in physial arrest. The physis can be missed partially or as a whole by open wound causing physical arrest. It was described by Dr. Rang and Dr. Peterson. In some anatomical locations, a physical injury can cause vascular insult to epiphysis, stopping nutrition to the germinal cells of uh, physis. Growth uh, proximal femoral epiphysis and radial head are the examples of this kind of location. Several classification system have, have been suggested. And Soltohes type, uh, Soltohes uh, classification is the current standard classification system. Dr. Solter and Harris published their classical paper back in 1963, classifying the physical injuries based upon mechanism of injury and relationship of the fracture line to the growing chondrocytes. Type one is caused by shearing and aversion force it is common at birth or early childhood. It is easily reducible and usually gives excellent results. Type two is the commonest type. Triangular metaphyseal fragment called the Thurston Holland sign is the radiographic hallmark of this type. The periosteum on Thurston Holland fragment side usually remains intact, while the periosteum on the other side is torn and stripped from the metaphysis. Type two has also excellent result in most cases. Type three is an uncommon intraarticular fracture. So accurate reduction of the articular surface should be done. Type four fracture also requires accurate reduction at both articular surface and physis, unless accurately reduced 
a bone bridge may be formed between the epiphyses and metaphyses, causing physical arrest. And joint incongruity will ensue. Type 5 is caused by crushing, usually at the weight bearing hinge joint like ankle or knee joint. Severe abduction or adduction force in these joints may cause this type of physical injury. It may be misdiagnosed as sprain because there is no stigmata on x ray. Physical arrest is almost inevitable. Dr. Rang from Toronto City uh, Hospital uh, described other type of physical injury. It is a traumatic defect of the perichondrial ring or John of Ranvier. Uh, this injury does not belong to any types of solitary system and uh, may produce peripheral bone breach and cause angular deformity. The injury could be a glancing type, apparently not serious, for example, a cut by lawn mower. The most common type of sorter head system is type two, followed by type one, type three, type four. And type five is quite rare, but uh, it must be underdiagnosed to some extent. Distal radius and distal tibia are the most, two most common locations of physical injury. Dr. Ogden from Yale University presented further sub subtypes and additional types to Soto Harris system. For example, he subclassified cases in which metaphyseal beak crushes the growing chondrocytes as type 1C and 2D. However, they are theoretical subtypes and usually difficult to detect by initial radiograph. Uh, community fractures were further subclassified as type 2B and 4B. Open reduction and internal fixation are needed in most cases. He also added type 7, which is a pure epiphyseal fracture. This does not involve uh, the physis, but may interfere with the epiphyseal growth. In 1993, Dr. Peterson from Mayo Clinic added an important type of physical injury uh, that does not belong to the salt to head system. It appears to be a metaphyseal fracture, but has extension to the physis. As a result, it has a risk of physical arrest, although it is not so high, only 3%. However, it is important to take this risk into consideration from the initial management. Several factors predisposing to physical arrest have been suggested. Sultrials type 4 and 5 have significantly high risk of physical arrest. Severely displaced fracture, open fracture, fracture of epiphysis with poor circulation, such as femoral head and radial head, have higher risk. Forceful reduction and prolonged fixation across the physis are uh, iatrogenic factors predisposing to physical arrest. Finally, younger patients have more growth potential, so they will have serious consequence from physical arrest, if ever. I'd like to close my talk stressing that Salter Harris five types, rank type six, and Peterson type one have therapeutic and prognostic significance. Management should be guided by these, the injury types and further damage to the physis should be avoided. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Taejun. Um, again, as usual, you are clear delivery of lectures and concepts. So uh, we will leave all the questions at the end of five lectures. So I would like to invite Saul A, who would talk to us about acute physical injury and management. Saul A, are you ready? Okay. All right, can you all see my slides? Yes, we can see. Okay. Okay, thank you for invitation to join this meeting. Now for management of physical injury at the lower limb, I'm going to, for this lecture, I'm going to use this A classification because it's more relevant to trauma and also covers a few patterns that not covered inside Salter Harris. 
E1 to E4 is basically the same as Salter Harry classification. E5 and 6 is Teo and also triplane fracture. E7 and E8 is abulsion fracture and osteochondral fracture, which we do not have in Salter Harry's and the rest. Now, the aim of treatment is basically to improve bone alignment and to prevent displacement. But we know that children fracture heels fast, heals well with remodeling. We also know that all intervention comes with the risk of patient. Now, to plan who to treat and how to treat, the factors involve these four types. First thing is the pattern of the fracture. We base this on classification. Number two, degree of displacement. Three, the age, because that dictate the degree of the modeling and sometimes patient and family expectation. Now we are going to focus more on acute uh, from operative treatment because limitation of time. Now the healing and also remodeling depends a lot on the growth plate. So we should try to avoid injury to growth plate by these few techniques. One, if you use fixation methods, it should be smaller diameter, if possible, smooth surface, less number of fixations, reduce attempt. Now, three fixations is even safe. Three fixations with three attempts is less traumatic compared to two fixations with 20 attempts. And finally, if we have to go through five seal plate, we want to equally space them in the opposite end of the growth plate. All of us are quite familiar with upper limb supracondylar fracture, different methods of fixation patterns. In fact, in the lower limbs, this lacrima, it is roughly the same. Okay? However, there is something missing. Some of, us, some of us do two lateral fixation, either parallel or divergent but we don't do this in the distal femur. This is because elbow is the growing end of the bone. It's not the growing end of the bone. You don't have growth arrest, whereas distal femur or the knee is the growing end. Unilateral column fixation, high risk to develop growth arrest, and it may develop angulation deformity. So we don't do that. That is the main difference. Now, AOE1 or Salter Harris type one, this is extra articular with a lower risk of physio injury. Quite often, we can treat non-operatively. Now, this is a 10-year-old boy with twisting injury over the ankle. So this is type 1 fracture separation. But since this is intra-articular, so it was reduced and fixed with one wire and it, it healed up very well. Now, this is distal femur, distal femur fracture, type 1. It is quite similar to supracondylar fracture that we see in the humerus. And K. Wilkins believes that we should treat it the same way as well. So the patient should be in prone position, distract and flex like we do for the elbow. And it is unstable, so we should fix it. The only thing is the fixation, we should do cross rather than two lateral pinning because of the risk of growth arrest. Now, this 13-year-old boy had uh, hip dislocation as well as type 1 fracture of a femur head. Although with acute correction and uh, screw fixation, the risk of AVN, as you can see here, is really very high. Now, AO type 2 or Salter Harris type 2 fracture, it is roughly similar to type 1 except it is more stable and we have a metaphysis which can use for fixation. So 12 year old boy with a right knee injury, Salter is type two. So it can be reduced in the similar method. The only difference as type one is that we can fix the metaphysial segment. It's a quite stable and it healed up quite well. Now this nine year old boy, right ankle injury, again, Salter Harris type two or AO type two, two of distal tibia, close reduction, there is a gap here and there is some translation, so it needs to be opened up. Now, the surgeon made the CT scan not because to see the fracture, 
but to evaluate whether the metaphyseal fragment is big enough to be fixed or not. The decision is not big enough. So after open reduction, we use cross K wire, small smooth wires from both sides of the physeal plate. Now AOE3 or Salter Harris 3, this is intra-articular fracture. So it usually requires anatomical reduction and internal fixation. Now, this is a special example here, six-year-old boy with a right ankle injury. Now, you compare to the opposite side, obviously, the medial malleolus is injured here. But before you do anything, are you able to reduce it better? Is fixation really necessary? Now, six-year-old age comes in because remodeling is good. We decided non-operative treatment, just put in a cast, it heals up quite well. AOE4 or Salteris 4, again intraarticular fracture like type 3, except that it is not so stable proximally. It can move up. So this 10-year-old boy, the right ankle injury, the lateral malleoli we saw just now, this is medial side, small metaphyseal fragment. It is unstable, but uh, it can be fixed through the epiphysis without disrupting the physeal plate. So this is one year later, we still have to monitor to make sure there is no physeal bridge growing across. Now, AO5 is a tilo fracture. It is a Salter Harris type 3, but AO use 5, a separate category. It is due to caused by external rotation force. Now, the problem is the diagnosis is easily missed. So you see here, we need a special view to look at it. This is a good example. We can't see the fracture line at all. The only clue, there's a step in the articular surface on the lateral view, CT scan, then you see the whole picture. Now, it can be treated without opening up because sometimes when the fragment is small, displacement is not so much. But for those people who like to rehab and go back to sports early, or the bigger the piece is big and displacement is small, it can be treated with internal fixation. Nowadays, percutaneous approach is a minimal invasive. It can be done through a small incision like this one. You see, from the small hole, the K-wire, one single K-wire can be used to reduce, to fix, as well to insert the cannulated screw. This is what you can get through that small hole. Now, AOE6 is triplane fracture. Salter Harris, it is a type 4, but this is a separate category. Mechanism of injury, age group is roughly the same as Tilo fracture. This is 11-year-old girl. It's a bit early for this fracture, but it happens. On the AP view, Salter Harris type 3 looks like a Tilo fracture, but on the lateral view, you see it looks like Salter Harris type 2. When you have 3 and 2, it is Salter Harris Four. It is a triplane fracture. The CT scan will tell the whole diagnosis. So this case, because of 11 years old, the physio plate is still open. So smooth and small wires is being used. Generally, it is more, more common in the older children. Now we come to AOE7 or avulsion fracture. We are getting this a bit more often now because adolescent children go into sports if the fragment displays not so much, it can be treated non-operatively with either full extension or 30 degree flexion to relax the, uh, the ACL. But uh, many people now are doing operative treatment, arthroscopically reduce it and fix using suture or screw fixation as we see over here. It allows earlier rehab and earlier back to sports. So then 11 year old boy, this is again, not common. You see there is a local tenderness after a twisting inversion injury, but you can't see very well compared to the opposite side, what is the injury. Anyway, we treat as a, as a fracture. Later we notice it is a fracture that heals up very well, but this is again an avulsion type of injury and this is not classified under Salter Harris. It is in the epiphyseal plate. Now, finally, AOE8, articular fragment. Now, this is fortunately rare. There is a lot of overlapping with uh, osteochondritis. Dissecans depends on the mechanism of injury, whether there's acute trauma. 
but the piece is intra-articular, so treatment is roughly the same. Capitulum fracture is also a fall into this group, but more commonly, it is in the adult rather than children. So type 8 fracture is fortunately less common in children. Now, fracture of the physio plate are associated with their own sets of problems. Non-union and growth arrest, fortunately not so common, but it do happen. Like we see over here, medial malleoli fracture, treated non-operatively, it ends up the physeal or the growth plate is probably arrested and there is a non-union over there. On the other hand, overcorrection like this case, similar injury treated, I think there is a four K wires there. So also end up with a physeal arrest and non-union. But uh, more commonly, what we see is this physeal bar formation, which ends up with a progressive angulation, sometimes with a limb or bone, length, uh, bone shortening. Angulation, as we can see over here, can be quite significant. This 10-year-old boy left knee injury, yeah, quite young, but uh, there is no real displacement. But careful look at the x-ray, you can see there are fragments over here. It's either type 2 or type 3 fracture. And then we decided at 10 not to do any intervention, just hold it with a cast. And then on follow-up, he returned only after three years. You see there's a physio plate and genovalgum deformity. But then we are very sure this is not due to intervention, but due to trauma itself. So in summary, the main objective for treatment of physio plate fracture is to improve alignment, avoid displacement when this is indicated. We know children heal fast, heal well, as long as growth plate and the other soft tissue are healthy, so when we plan to go for treatment to do this, we have to make sure we should avoid secondary injury to the growth plate. This can be achieved by careful dissection of the soft tissue when we want to reduce and proper techniques to perform internal fixation. So if there is any take home message, we have to inform the family before, before you discharge a patient or put on long-term follow-up, inform the family about the risk of injury to the bone factory, which may not be obvious after months or years after initially good outcome. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Soye. Uh, so now Evelyn is going to take on to tell us how to warn the family of the complications in the bone factory. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Professor Hurry, for your introduction. So I'm going to talk to you about complications of healing after these physial injuries. And uh, we will find that we are halfway through our session, so hopefully you have a good introduction to these physial injuries, and I'm here to tell you what can possibly go wrong. So much of my talk is taken from this brilliant book written by Hamlet Peterson from the Mayo Clinic. I encourage all of you to read this. It's a very thorough, very detailed book, and it goes through physical injuries um, very, very well. Before I get into what can go wrong with the healing of the physical injuries, I still want to emphasize that you still have to take care of the acute complications, okay? So you still have to take care of the vascular injuries and neurological injuries, things like compartment syndrome and open fractures, these things all have to be dealt with well before you can go on to the subsequent complications of physeal injuries. Now in Hamlet Peterson's book, he divides, he talks about complications which he calls manifest later and there's a long list of them. And I actually took the liberty of renaming that and this is actually really just complications of healing after physeal injuries. And there are two main groups. There are those injuries that happen, which are not specific to physeal injuries, like non-union and malunion. And then there are injuries that are specific to the fact that these injuries occurred at a physis. So we'll go through the non-specific complications first, things that can pretty much happen anywhere in the body. It just happens to be a physeal injury. Now, non-unions classically happen in lateral condyle fractures. This is a contribution of the pull of the extensor tendons and also the intraarticular nature of the injury. So this is a boy who had the injury, refused all treatment and then disappeared for months before coming back with a bump over the lateral aspect of the elbow. So non-union does happen in physial injuries. You can also get malunion 
Occasionally, this can happen without it developing any physial arrest. And so this will cause an angular deformity, but not a progressive one. However, more commonly, this will actually cause a physial arrest, and these patients will present with a deformity, which gets progressively worse with time. And unfortunately, this is really an iatrogenic problem. These things happen because the injury was not reduced well and not fixed properly. And there are other nonspecific injuries such as synostosis, heterotopic ossification that leads to loss of range of motion, but they really are quite rare and exist in the literature just as case reports only. Now we get to the big topic of complications that happen that are specific to the physial injury. And of course, the biggest thing that we're all worried about and all concerned about is the physial arrest. And as mentioned before, there are many different ways to classify them, but essentially you're looking at the Salter-Harris classification here. Essentially, this will really happen if the injury passes through the resting zone of the physis or the germinative zone where the uh, progenitor cells lie. Now, if the physial arrest happens in over 50% of the physis, this will lead to shortening of that particular bone. The amount of limb length inequality that you finally get will depend on two things. One is how much that physis contributes to the longitudinal growth of that particular bone. And secondly, how old the patient is. How much growth does he have remaining in his life? So for example, you will see here, this is a complete growth arrest of the proximal tibia. And over here, we have one boy who had a growth arrest of the distal femur in childhood. And by the time he reached skeletal maturity, the length discrepancy was seven centimeters, quite significant. In contrast, this is a boy who had an injury to his distal tibia, very young at three years of age. But by the time he was 13 years old, the length discrepancy was only about four centimeters. So this is because the distal tibia physis contributes less to the overall length of the lower limb, and that's why he gets less limb length inequality. If the physial arrest occurs in less than 50% of the physis, then you'll get an angular deformity. So for example, you see here a fracture through the medial aspect of the distal tibia uh, physis, and this with time results in a varus deformity of his ankle. Now us pediatric orthopedic surgeons, we would be tempted to simply put in a guided growth procedure, such as an eight plate in this patient. However, as you can see, this is actually two years after the insertion of the eight plate and it didn't work, nothing um, corrected. And that's because for eight plates to actually work, you actually still need sufficient growth from the remaining half of the physis. And if it's actually too far gone, then it won't work. But I'm sure you'll hear more about this later when we talk about how to actually manage uh, a physial arrest. A less common complication after physial injuries is ischemic necrosis of the physis. And this can occur because the resting zone of the physis receives its blood supply from the epiphyseal artery. So if there is sufficient trauma to disrupt the epiphyseal artery, you can actually get ischemic necrosis of the entire epiphysis and also the physis. This is not my case. This is taken from the chapter by Dr. Peterson. I myself have never seen it, but this the theoretically can happen. And then lastly, we talk about overgrowth. Now the most common type of overgrowth is simply relative. It's not genuine. For example, we have this boy here who was hit by a taxi. He had a distal radius fracture. We pinned it, but actually with time, we found that he had a growth arrest of the distal radius. And from the x-rays, you see that there is a relative overgrowth of the distal ulna. The distal ulna hasn't grown more, it's simply longer relative to the distal radius. He has a lot of impingement syndromes, symptoms, and so we eventually did an ulna shortening osteotomy for him. But you can get genuine overgrowth after a physial injury, and this is the most classic example. After a lateral condyle fracture, you have an overgrowth of the lateral aspect of the distal humerus. Now, some people say that this may be due to the elevation of the periosteum, but as you can see here, we did an open reduction. It's a perfect reduction, good fixation, and it healed well, but still somehow on the lateral aspect of the lateral condyle, you see this overgrowth of bone here, which results in a bump for the patient. And we do warn them of these uh, problems beforehand, so they're not surprised by it afterwards. You can also get genuine overgrowth of the adjacent physis either the physis in the bone itself. So for example, 
if there is a severe distal proximal tibia injury, the distal tibia might try to grow more bone to make up for the length, or actually in this case, the physis of the distal femur overgrew to make up for the leg lift discrepancy experienced by this patient, but this is less common. And finally, you can get a genuine overgrowth of the ossification center, such as this case report here, where the olecranon overgrew so much it no longer fit into the olecranon fossa, and it caused a reduction in the extension of this elbow. And this is a example from Dr. Peterson's book where the medial malleolus actually overgrew after a malunion and a growth arrest. Even after the osteotomy, the medial malleolus actually overgrew compared to the other side. So complications of healing after physial injuries can happen in the upper limbs and the lower limbs. Most commonly, it results in some sort of, sort of growth arrest, either partial or complete, but occasionally even overgrowth can occur. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, <clears throat> you are too fast, you know. <clears throat> I should allow you uh, 10 minutes. So uh, never mind, let's move on to uh, uh, Chao Wang, who's going to talk about, uh, well, Faisal Bar, the most challenging thing. So can you see the slide? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me um, in this wonderful meetings. So I'm going to talk about how to make a diagnosis and manage physio bars. So physio bars by, def by definition is a bony or fibrous bridge crossing the growth plate. It's usually the result of injury to the reserve zone of the growth plate. So as mentioned before, um, the physio bar actually occurs in around one to 10% of all physio fractures. And it can actually um, uh, follow any types of uh, sort of Harris uh, 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 physio fractures. It's more commonly uh, seen in uh, lower limb uh, physio fractures, in particular around the knee and distal tibia, uh, because of their association with a high energy trauma. Um, the other causes of a physio bar also include infections, tumor, irradiation, ischemia, and could be also it can also be iatrogenic. Uh, with uh, implants or smooth pin or wire screws passing through the physis during fracture fixation. So um, the physio bars can usually form within a few months after physio fractures, but the timing of bone formation is less predictable with uh, infective course. And that's why we have to follow up for a longer period of time before discharge, discharging those patients suffering from infections. Uh, um, and for irradiations, it can take months or years to happen. So the physio bar uh, is classified uh, according to its location. It could be peripheral, which usually will result in significant uh, angulations. And it could also be linear with the physio bar crossing the whole physis uh, from anterior to posterior border with a normal physis on each side of the physio bar. It can also be central with a normal physis surrounding the physis. If it's really in the center, you cause a leg length discrepancy but it can also be uh, eccentric, resulting in angulation and shortening. So uh, a sclerotic bone bridge in the X-ray confirms the diagnosis. Okay. Uh, however, with the presence of an asymmetry of the Harris line, could be the earliest sign for radiological uh, 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 bone bar. The Harris line uh, forms at the location of the physis at the time of injury, presumably uh, due to uh, uh, temporary cessation of growth secondary to the uh, physio trauma. The interval between the Harris line and the physis indicates the amount of growth since injury. If the growth is normal, the Harris line should be parallel to the physis. And this is a very beautiful x-ray showing the uh, convergence of the uh, Harris line and the physis posteriorly at the knee joint. And this could be the earliest indication of the presence of a developing physio bar. Tenting is very specific to a central physio bar uh, due to the tattering effects of the uh, physis. And commonly they present with a significant leg length discrepancy. Angulation actually is the result of uh, a peripheral bar. And this is an example of a linear bar. Um, you, you, you see a lot of uh, shortening, but you don't see any tenting. tenting. And in the lateral X-ray, you see that the uh, ankle joint actually uh, angulate 
anteriorly due to the asymmetrical involvement of the linear bar, more severe on the anterior part. If surgery is contemplated, uh, further imaging with MRI or CT is, uh, uh, is needed. Okay, uh, mapping actually allows more precise uh, uh, measurements of the size of the physis as well as local localization of the of the physis uh, in the of the uh, of the physio bar in the affected physis. MRI is a preferred choice uh, compared to CT because with the, this special sequence, it gives you the best quality of a physio image and mapping, and the MRI also allows earlier detection of the fibrous bar as well as the fact that there is no radiation, which is an uh, advantage for uh, ch uh, children. The aim of treatment is to restore the potential for growth and to mitigate the, the deformity uh, resulting from the growth of rest. And the surgical options include facial bar excision plus other uh, additional procedures to uh, uh, correct the deformity. The other surgical options include epiphysiodesis and os osteotomy. In the interest of time, I'll focus on the physio bar excision. So the mere presence of a physio bar is not an indication for uh, excisions. The, the physio bar is indicated for excision only when there is uh, evidence of a growth disturbance with existing uh, uh, or developing deformity. The physio bar is, uh, meant, is indicated for excision if it's less than 50% of size. Uh, excision of a larger of uh, uh, bar usually results in recurrence of a uh, 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 bone bar formation. And the patient should have at least two years of remaining growth. And if the facial bar is secondary to uh, an infective cause, the area should be free of drainage for at least uh, one year. So the, the principle of a facial bar excision actually is to uh, achieve a complete removal of the bone, bone bar with minimal damage to the normal surrounding uh, tissues. And the classical uh, uh, procedure is described by langan Skewers in 1967. Uh, okay, the physio bar is removed with a high speed bird through a cortical window and tunnel. The exposure is pretty limited. And many a times you need a dental mirror to help to assess the, uh, the completions of whether the, the excision is complete or not. And the cavity is uh, filled up with uh, uh, interposition material to prevent uh, the recurrence of the bone bar. Many different uh, types of uh, interposition materials has been described in the literatures and adipose tissues and bone cements are the uh, most commonly used uh, uh, nowadays. I'm sure that Professor Hoy will actually um, enlighten us on the you know, future research on, uh, on the uh, 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 regener on the possibility of a regeneration of the uh, growth plate. And this is a case example. Um, Five-year-old boy with a central facial bar. The cause, exact cause is unknown. Uh, he pre presented with a length discrepancy of 2.5 centimeter. So uh, a Glenkin skewer procedure was uh, performed with a bone window over here and the bar was uh, removed. So the length discrepancy remains static, okay, uh, 20 months after the initial surgery. And you can see the gradual reduction of the tenting. But after four years, I post up four years, the leg length discrepancy was found to progress to four centimeters. And if you look at the x-ray, despite the reduction of the tentings, you can see some sclerosis around the previous operator site. And CT scan actually confirms the reformations of the bone bar. So a repeated length and score procedure was performed at the age of nine. At with a leg length discrepancy of four centimeters. And the final uh, leg length discrepancy as skeletal maturity is 4.5 centimeters. So if you look at the uh, uh, position of the screw, it shows steady growth away from the physis. And the patient eventually opt for femoral length lengthening instead of uh, 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 epiphyseal disease. Well, having to remove the whole physio bar with minimal damage to the uh, 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 surrounding knobs as uh, uh, soft tissue is actually quite challenging and demanding. And this is largely uh, due to the fact that the exposure is very limited with uh, poor illuminations. So uh, nowadays people will try to use an uh, arthroscope with the inherent uh, light source 
as well, or using a headlight with coaxial light source that will actually improve the illum uh, illuminations. Dental mirrors and arthroscope actually helps to improve the visualization for assessments of uh, whether the uh, bone bar is excised completely. Navigations or uh, patient specific guides has also been reported in the uh, literatures, uh, trying to improve the precisions of a removal of the facial bar. But if you're short of all this high tech stuff, the gestions modification could be useful. So instead of using a, a, a cortical window with a bone tunnels, a pre drilled tap and tapped metaphysial wedge is removed somewhere around half to one centimeter from the physis. And that will give you a very beautiful direct approach to the uh, physial bar. Spontaneous corrections after the facial bar resection is actually quite unpredictable. And that's why um, a concomitant uh, osteotomy or growth modulation is recommended if the angulations, uh, uh, angulation is more than 20 degrees at the time of uh, surgery. And with an osteotomy, it also has an additional advantage that the exposure is largely improved. So this is another case, 40 months old girl uh, with history of uh, right knee septic arthritis, uh, treated with uh, uh, drainage and IV antibiotic in the, in, in the other hospital. The patient was referred to me at age of uh, 14 months with 27 degrees of genuine welcome and shortening of two centimeter. So MRI confirms a central but eccentric uh, physical bar and that explains the shortening and the uh, 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 angulations. So the, the easiest way is to do uh, uh, correct the deformity with a closing wedge and then go for the facial bar excision. But uh, this will actually further shorten the, the, uh, the, the femur. So we go for this wire-shaped osteotomy and then try to put this medial wedge to the lateral side for correction of deformity without any shortening. So this is after the osteotomy, showing the uh, osteotomy end on the distal femur. And with a retraction of the proximal fragments, the facial bar can be approached directly. So a curet is, is used to actually remove the cancellous bone covering the facial bar. And the facial bar is removed with a high speed bird and continuous irrigation is very important to lower the temperature because the heat generated from the bird can actually damage the normal facial cartilage. So this is a picture trying to show you the whitish structures here. That is the normal uh, facial cartilage. I have to put a, uh, a forceps here because the camera would not focus on this dark hole without this forceps. And this is an adipose uh, uh, a graft from the buttock, okay, that would help, that would actually fill up the cavities. And that is the medial wedge actually put in the lateral side that helps to correct the deformity. And the osteotomy is fixed with a cross uh, wire. And you see that there are two vascular clips trying to, um, that helps to monitor the, gro uh, the growth after the surgery. So this is uh, post-op five months LD remains at two centimeter, one and a half years after surgery, still with significant shortening. And you are seeing some catching ups of the lignin discrepancy. You can see that the distance of the two vascular clips is increasing accordingly. And post op five year, and this is post op nine year with a residual shortening of uh, one point two centimeter. For the peripheral facial bar, um, it's surgically less demanding. It can be approached directly, but the key point is that is that you have to excise the uh, bone bar together with the overlying perosteum. And the uh, closure of the perosteum actually will result in, in reformations of the bone bar. And the gap should be filled up with uh, any interposition graph. Complication of the uh, procedures. Uh, facial bar reformation occurs in around 18% of, of cases. And many of the time they are due to uh, the uh, displacement of the uh, interposition uh, graft. Infection occurs in 3% and usually they happen uh, uh, in, in cases resulting from uh, uh, previous infections. 
Resumption of around 84% of growth of the normal site is expected after a successful uh, uh, excision of the physio bar. 13% 13 of cases do not need further surgery. Well, the rest need further surgery because of the residual uh, leg length discrepancy or deformity. Quick prognosis are seen in patients who have smaller physio bar, in particular less than 25%, in younger patients, and in those patients who are picked up uh, early after the injury and with a uh, treatment offered uh, early. And facial bar secondary to trauma actually behave or recover much better uh, compared with those uh, uh, resulting from infections. So epifacial diseases, in general, they are indicated for uh, cases that is not suitable for facial bar uh, resection. So um, for those with a central bar uh, resulting in uh, contr uh, uh, resulting in ligament discrepancy. Contralateral limb epifacial disease uh, would be a good procedure if the projected uh, uh, RLD ischemic is uh, more than two or less than five centimeter. Uh, with patient, a patient with peripheral bar, uh, isolateral epifacial disease will actually help to uh, reduce uh, or the severity or the progression of the deformity. And a contralateral limb epifacial disease actually will uh, reduce the um, leg length discrepancy at skeletal maturity. Osteotomy for acute corrections or lengthening are uh, indicated in patients who have severe deformity and near skeletal maturity. So in summary, early recognition of the facial arrest allows timely and effective management. And surgical intervention depends on the size of the facial bar, the growth potential remaining, and the existing or anticipated deformity. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Chao Wang. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, can everyone see that? Yes. Great. yes. Okay, yes. so uh, I would uh, complete the final talk here on really uh, something uh, totally different for um, from everyone else is a very uh, sort of like basic, also a little bit um, a boring subject compared to all the nice clinical x-rays you saw early on. So I did also following Evelyn, you know, like um, try to look for um, inspiration from Hamlet, uh, Peterson's book and the publications, but uh, I also couldn't find much of future. So I here I am just telling you about what the so-called preclinical research of five cell uh, repair. So outline the lecture will be on uh, pathophysiology of physios and uh, the animal models in physio repair and what people try to use modulation for the injury, injury pathways and what are the cell therapy uh, available. First, this is a chronological sequence of what happened on the physio uh, injury day. Day one, you get a lot of inflammatory cells infiltrating and they have a lot of inflammatory mediators like TNF-alpha, uh, interleukin, all this happening. But leave unchecked, you get the fibrogenic phase about day seven, you can see infiltration on the MSCs uh, coming up. Unfortunately, these MSCs will just uh, go into uh, intramembranous uh, ossification through a recruitment. And unlike the endochondral ossification you like to form a nice uh, physis as uh, TJ showed. Then continue this, would be day 14, you got osteogenic phase and you form of bony trabecular. And finally, this bar form and they did not form cartilaginous cells. And of course, later you do have a uh, remodeling. So if any of the younger colleagues here who are uh, pursuing academic career would like to uh, involve yourself in this horrible journey of uh, physio uh, repair in animal models. This is a very validated animal models, very cheap, uh, available red model. You can use a 18G sterile a needle to identify. And after that, you can two millimeter drill bead and enlarge it. And this model beauty is that you do not need any X-rays or II to confirm because very nicely, this uh, we can see on both histology confirm you are, as long you are perpendicular to uh, the intramedullar uh, region, you can actually very nicely created this uh, 
suffice to arrest model. And you always can use the contralateral uh, knee uh, where you get nice outside blue to have an intact physis uh, for you to see and compare. So uh, in the literature, people did try to use uh, uh, modulation of intrinsic pathways, such as try to get uh, uh, VGFF as a receptor block and also inhibition microRNA to see uh, they get uh, a nice uh, blockage of this intrinsic pathway from happening and physio bar. And Chong from uh, uh, Bruce Foster's lab, they use a neutral field neutralizing anti serum, also suppress osteoblastic differentiation. And Jensen Fair also um, managed to prevent uh, intramembranous bone formation when they managed to reduce the TNF alpha signals. So people like me, uh, not very original, but we'll try to uh, you know, stand on the shoulder of the giants by, let me see if I target uh, interleukin-1 and TNF uh, alpha on the day one of uh, inflammatory phase. So try to attack them and then see whether uh, these uh, have any effect. So there it goes, I use a, a P2D7KK, which is anti-interleukin one beta, and don't ask me what's P2D7, it sounds like R2D2 in uh, Star Wars. And or I also use a uh, inflexic uh, MAC, uh, which is NT-TNF alpha, which also uh, try to uh, treat them at the day one or at the inflammatory phase. So you can see some of the results at the 3D modeling or the bone bridge. You can see um, those unoperated sites, of course, nothing will happen. And the one that destroy with the uh, physical arrest, you got bone bar. So uh, when I use anti-TNF, anti-interleukin, uh, there's some reduction of the uh, bone bar formation. However, uh, growth plate regeneration is not to its normality and therefore it's not sufficient enough uh, to cause a regeneration. That's why uh, people uh, use uh, cell-based uh, therapies. So uh, Thomas Wolf from uh, Germany, and uh, he uh, spent some time with uh, Bruce Foster in the early 1990s in Adelaide. They used a periosteal graft um, into a, a, this uh, physio arrest uh, 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 treatment in the uh, old, uh, sheep model. So you can see that uh, they managed to, grow, uh, to correct the growth deformity but they also find that they, it's difficult to get the physio, normal physio cartilage regeneration. And later, of course, uh, the sexy word of uh, missing homo stem cells and stem cell comes in and they all publish in these high impact factor uh, journals like Blood, uh, Nature, and uh, JCD. And of course, I also uh, uh, jump on just, just at the rest. So um, Bruce Foster, again, um, you know, he used uh, autologous uh, bone marrow device, MSCs, to uh, uh, try to repair uh, and transplant on to the defect site. But he found that uh, uh, only a dense uh, fibrous tissue, although he sort of uh, prevent them from going to the, the bony and trabecular uh, phase. Then uh, again, I follow suit and um, in the rapid model, you know, creating a physio arrest virus, and we manage to correct the physio deformity and with some resemblance of highline cartilage. And this we manage also to uh, com uh, so confirm in uh, further uh, models in FICE, uh, in uh, rabbit and also in sheep models. However, comes uh, 2016. Uh, this is the latest uh, sexy uh, uh, word you need to learn, which is actually uh, extracellular uh, microviscose or called uh, MSC exosomes. These are very small uh, secretomes by MSCs. They have all the qualities of MSCs without uh, needing the MSC uh, donation. So the beauty of this is they have very nice MSCs and MSC uh, uh, exosome can modulate uh, um, all these inflammatory cytokine. And yet because it has an MSC cellular therapy. It also can regenerate. And the beauty can also come from the clonal uh, saw, like a uh, single immortalized uh, lines. And this is my uh, 
my uh, collaborator who uh, uh, invented this and we did use them for osteochondral regeneration in articular cartilage. So the study design here was, was 72 rats and we go into two main groups, one group on the PBS and one group on the MSC esosome. You can see at four weeks, of course, um, the, the uh, leg length discrepancy is quite prominent, but at eight weeks, MSC esosome uh, start to has some kind of regeneration and improve in the ling length uh, discrepancy. And you can see histology, um, the, the, at four weeks, uh, there's really a minimal sort of regeneration of the uh, uh, physio cartilage. But at eight weeks, uh, you can see more and more MSC uh, regeneration at the um, uh, growth plate. So, in looking at uh, analyzing them uh, uh, histology, uh, histologically, we find that uh, at eight weeks for suffering O, uh, which measurement of physio cartilage, get more and more positive compared to four weeks. And also a measurement of highline cartilage, they are more so uh, collagen type two at eight weeks compared to four weeks. So this is something uh, quite exciting. We managed to sort of regenerate part of this so in literature, people also use a biomaterial-based approach. And however, again, um, this, they found that they're not enough to find mechanical support uh, for the physio regeneration. And of course, uh, 3D printing come on board now, and people also try to use 3D printing to print this uh, biomaterial into the physio uh, uh, growth arrest and try to uh, uh, so regenerate them. So lastly, uh, just a bit of a clinical case, um, you know, where you can see what the child bands show. And then here we are using uh, MSC cells and add on osteotomy. But sadly, uh, in really uh, trying all this so-called in the future, very few uh, publications, and one of which actually uh, attribute to uh, Visha Majuri from uh, Velo, and she used it for uh, autologous chondrocyte implantation to show patient uh, had a good uh, ACI uh, uh, results in the long term. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And here I am, um, try to start the next session on uh, Q&A. And uh, so uh, I have a bit of a um, uh, thing to introduce about all my uh, um, fellow speakers from APOA. Uh, and I think actually most of you will have met them during uh, Goa. Uh, they all came for the Goa uh, meeting. That's where they are interaction with uh, Indian faculties and Indian delegates. And that's why when I um, approach them to come and join me uh, for this uh, uh, seminar, they are all very uh, uh, enthusiastic and uh, willing to uh, spend their uh, Saturday night uh, for this. And I just realized uh, uh, Pamal actually put me uh, in this slide. You see that uh, I'm uh, actually... Uh, moderator and not part of the international faculty. So I should, I thought um, uh, uh, Pramal that I to ask uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi to give me a, a honorary a citizenship very soon. So um, some of the question here uh, to be asked. James, it's granted to you. Yeah, so James, Indian citizenship has been granted and a POSI membership. Yes, thank you. So I don't need to pay any membership. So can you just stop, stop sharing your slides? Yeah. 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 Please stop so, start, so we can yeah. see everybody. So. so I will start asking questions that have been raised. Uh, so question number one will be uh, uh, addressed to uh, uh, Professor uh, Tejun Cho. Can you highlight to us how do you differentiate type one and type five, uh, not retrospectively, but right at the word go? Uh, actually, <clears throat> type one is very evident because it is separation. So plain X-ray shows uh, the it is uh, type one very uh, very well, but type five is actually we cannot uh, see it on plain X-ray uh, in the initial evaluation. So uh, I wonder whether we can see it by MRI if uh, we take it, but usually we do not take MRI uh, in those cases. So. The basically type five is uh, uh, the retrospective diagnosis. So after some kind of sprain, like a, uh, six months or a year later, 
they will de they develop some uh, kind of angular deformity. Then retrospectively, we think that uh, the patient had uh, type five injury at, uh, at the time. Yeah. So the type five cannot make diagnosis in acute phase, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of people try to say, can we predict the future instead of, uh, you know, retrospectively? And, but of course, we can always pre-warn the parents. So follow up, another question is, you know, um, another area where type 1 is mentioned was distal uh, uh, fibula physis. So the, do you believe uh, there's such thing as type 1 or type 5 in the uh, distal uh, fibula physis? Tejun? Type 5 in the distal fibula physis? I, I don't think it is. Type 1. Type one uh, yeah, type 1 is uh, pretty common in distal fibula physis, but... Uh, the theoretically, type 5 is caused by the compression force. Yeah. So TBF, distal tibia fibula do not, uh, is not under the compression force in most cases. So it is hardly uh, yeah. possible. Yeah, but, but maybe I also asked the rest of the faculty on this type 1 in uh, distal fibula because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Uni uh, Nayagam actually uh, won a prize in the Posner in the prospective trial stating there's no such thing as type one in distal fibula uh, physis. So can anyone like to chip in to answer this question? Yeah. yeah. Right. Go ahead. Yes, Evelyn, yeah. No, I, I read the same paper that you're talking about written by Uni at SickKids about um, the reality of type 1 injuries in distal fibula and actually what he did was he did an MRI on every single child who presented to him with an inversion injury and he found that type 1 injuries are not as common as we think and actually children are capable of having ATFL sprains and uh, injuries and actually I think correct me if I'm wrong but the actual percentage of patients with a genuine type one injury of the distal fibula was only a few percent. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Which is uh, totally contradicted to publication right. in JPO by David Skett. Of course, uh, Skett will come on board tomorrow night so we can ask him the same question. Anyone else to uh, chip in for this question? Uh, James, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, so you know, the, the UNI paper was talking about sprains versus type one. So in that, it is right that, you know, you, you can have sprain and there's less incidence of type one. But if we talk about, uh, you know, fractures uh, like an inversion injury with a tibia fracture, for example, a medial malleolus fracture, then type one is very common. You see type one all the time. So I'm not, I won't agree that, you know, type one is uncommon. I think what we are trying to say is when you, when you think that there is a sprain, it is more likely to be a sprain than a type one. But when you have a tibia fracture, you are going to have a type 1 fibula fracture as well. So that way, it's very common when you see an ankle fracture injury. So yeah, I'm, I'm referring to only isolated distal fibula. That's not associated with a tibia fracture. Yeah, isolated distal fibula. I, I agree that there is complete, you know, reversal of what was thought about, you know, very, being it being very common. Yeah. yeah. Can, so can I tomorrow, ask you? Can I ask you a question, James, uh, or do we... No, I, I haven't finished asking the rest, so you, you cannot... Okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do it at the end. Yes, I will follow up with, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chao Wang, you mentioned that one of the uh, slides, although the group results are beyond 25, but yet one of the slides, you show that uh, 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 area uh, less than 50% can be attempted, because I, I'm a bit uh, less op optimistic. Uh, you know, if I thought anything less than uh, less, uh, more than 30%, I would think that they will not have any decent result. Well, I agree with you because the so called cutoff point 50% is quite arbitrary, to be frank. Yeah, so, in general, I, I would say the, the smaller the the, the facial bar, the better the result. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, because I just don't want the, the delegates to get away with the, they will attempt on 50%. That would be the. Uh, 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 scary on that, yeah. Okay, good. Yep, uh, you are, you're allowed to ask question, uh, 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 Shital, please. Uh, you know, I, I had a question for uh, for Dr. Ake, uh, you know, about the uh, AO classification that he used. What is the advantage or why would we use the AO classification instead of the Salter-Harris classification? 
Okay, uh, sorry, I, I, I correct first. He's Dr. Saw, uh, not Dr. Egg. Yeah, so Chinese, sometimes we write that way. Uh, yeah, just like uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Wang Chao, his surname is Chao and not Wang. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Now, I think in our center for the past, I think, five years, we have been using AO classification for general pediatric orthopedic classification. So because of that, then we followed for the salt we followed for the triplane and also the what they call the TO fracture as well. As you can see, there are a few types of fracture avulsion and all those things which are not included inside Salter Harris. But the main reason is not because of the physial fracture. It is because we document our fracture in all every week. We go through all the fractures and I want my uh, specialists all to classify them according to AO for documentation. So because of that, I've been using the, the, the E5 and E6, uh, E5 and E6 to be a triplane and also the tero fracture for that reason. So may I ask a question to Dr. Chong? James? Yeah, continue, yeah. Uh, may I ask a question to Wang Chou? Yeah. Uh, so in the evaluation of Faisal arrest, he mentioned about MRI, but MRI is just image. It does not reflect the function of Faisal. So in order to evaluate the function, uh, uh, have you ever used the bone scan or the more advanced image is SPECT CT that can show the function of Faisal uh, much better than MRI? Well, I think the past CT scan only shows the activities, not really the functions. Uh, so yeah. eventually, I think you have to rely on, um, say, picking up the deformity early. So, so there should be evidence of you know, a growth disturbance before you're really proceeding for surgery. Mm -hmm. But in the large phases like this, the femur proximal tibia, MRI shows very well. But uh, at the distal fibula, it is very small. So MRI does not give good uh, quality image. So the, sometimes in that case, I think the bone scan gives some uh, clue whether the physis is alive or not. Okay, so uh, more, more question here. Um, you know, if uh, for the four faculties, since you, you don't have the lab like mine to put in cells, so what sort of uh, interpositional material you like to use after you excise the physio bar? Maybe uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chao Wang can answer it first. Use fat, always. <laughs> okay, I know you have plenty of it, so it's okay. Yeah, that's so, right. Do you think fat graph, do you fix it? Do you, how do you hold it there? For the, you mean the fat graft? Yeah, do you just put it in or do you hold it somehow? Well, depends on whether it's a peripheral or a central. If it's central, okay, I use the fats to make sure that I cover the whole uh, physis, okay? And then I will use uh, additional gel foams to cover it on tops to make sure that there's no dislodgement. Okay, got it. Uh, but for, for peripheral bar, actually after excisions, you, I put sutures across the, uh, on top of the uh, uh, fat graft. Okay, Sorry, you. any comment? Oh. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Now, regarding this, I, I have been using fat, although I have to say that we don't have many cases like this, but I'm thinking whether this bone cement uh, will be better in the sense that we can see, we can monitor yeah, whether the bone is growing because we do bone cement for tumor many times like a GCT intra-articular, we shell until the cartilage left and put a lot of bone cement there and just stay on. Functionally, it will stay on, occupy that space reliably. Fat, I don't know, maybe it'll melt away. Anybody is using more regularly using bone cement? Yeah, I'm using bone cement more frequently than uh, fat uh, because I feel more confident uh, when I use bone cement that uh, it packs the, the, the bone, uh, the bone bridge excision defect. Right. Yeah, but uh, in the fat, uh, when I put the fat in there, I am not sure whether it uh, will stay there forever or it will come out, come up. 
Right. Okay, I, okay, I tell you well, something about, about, about fat. I have patient that I, uh, someone did a fat graph one year later when I went in to uh, redo, uh, the fat still remained there, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, usually have, it remained there. Sorry. Can I ask a question, James? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in your very busy slide, which you put about all the different, uh, you know, uh, things you can do to uh, modulate, uh, you had, I think I saw that you had experience using Fibrin, like you had some papers on it, on Fibrin. And no, I just uh, wanted to... yeah. No, that, that was more as a carrier, yeah, for myself, not, not so much uh, a standalone. Because there was a paper from China about using fibrin glue in the in the fracture site at the at the time of the fixation, and they were able to prevent growth arrest using fibrin glue. And I don't know if someone has any experience with that besides that paper. I've not heard it anywhere else. What was that? A clinical paper or a, a research paper? It was it was a research paper, uh, but uh, in an animal study. But yeah. we have, you know, at our center, we have used it in some high, uh, you know, uh, risk areas, and the results have been good. But it's in just a few patients, so we can't say that it works or it doesn't work. I just want to know if yeah. someone else has any experience with fibrin glue. And my my second question, James, was you talk about the chondrocyte transplant, but do you have any experience or any anything that you can, uh, uh, you know, focus on like a Pfizer transplant? You know, there were some papers, some excitement a while back, and I don't know where it is. No, you yeah, know, but uh, you, you know, the sad thing is I, uh, to prepare this talk, I tried to uh, look for a lot of papers and uh, there were a lot of reviews paper written on this topic. But unfortunately, I found a lot of the review paper end up citing my own paper. So I, I found it very disheartening. Like uh, I really feel this is like a, not a very um, hopeful, uh, uh, research direction for anyone to pursue. I, I shouldn't sound so negative, but uh, I don't know. Uh, Professor Cho, do you think I'm being very negative and pessimistic? Yeah. I'm pessimistic. Uh, actually, I continue to be pessimistic because we have to reconstruct the, the journal pattern of columnar structure. But if you put the, just the cells in there, how can you induce that kind of journal pattern? like uh, the col in columnar alignment. No, actually, that's the same argument people about uh, uh, Tao, even about articular cartilage. People feel that you yeah. should not, you should treat articular cartilage or physical cartilage as organ. You think of a liver, can you imagine? How can you put cells to, uh, to regenerate liver? But yet we are so simple. We think that uh, we just put in cell and then we create all the uh, zono uh, layers, which is uh, really, really uh, just very hopeful per se. Uh, I think another question for uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Chao Wang is that uh, how do you know you have done a complete excision of the bar intraoperatively? Well, this is a very good question. Again, it's very difficult. But uh, I will try to make sure that I can see a normal layers of uh, uh, physis circumferentially. That's when I will stop. How do you see it? How do you see it? First of all, you need a very good exposure. So your, your pre-op planning is very, very important. Okay, so I actually, I sometimes I use a dental mirror. Okay, uh, yeah. that really helps a lot. And if you have a direct uh, headlight source, uh, that also helps with the illumination. But my, my colleague, uh, Professor Wang Jun Yu, he's using arthroscope. This is even very, better. Yeah. yeah, dextrose, and he shows yeah. all the... Yeah. 360 degree, the con the cross plate images. Yeah, I'll so, try to use that ne next time. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a question to? Yep, Abi. Yep. Regarding the treatment, uh, you said uh, you add an ost corrective osteotomy for uh, any deformity more than 20 degrees around the knee. A lot of newer papers are saying, uh, especially for the deformities near the ankle, like not accepting more than even 10 degrees and adding an osteotomy. What do you feel about that? Yeah, for ankle, I think you can be more aggressive. Actually, um, so-called 20 degrees, I think it's a range. Somebody actually recommending, you know, correcting the deformity, uh, even the angulation, even if the deformity is more than 10 degrees. And actually people are trying to use the growth modulation instead of osteotomy. But for myself, I think it would be nice because the correction is quite unpredictable. 
and it would be nice that you have uh, immediate good corrections after the surgery, number one. And number two, I find that the osteotomy the helps uh, with the surgical exposure, which is a very important part of the surgery. Is there an age limit you would recommend to the... Uh... Avi, can I ask you to stop? Uh, we have a lot of cases and probably we'll uh, share a lot of answers in that. So, for lack of time, we'll move to cases because that's going to bring the flavor. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I will let uh, Pramal take over this and I will, I will take my rest. Goodbye. <laughs> so hang on, James. Uh, I'll invite the speaker, our first case presenter, Dr. P. N. Gupta, to uh, start his uh, mic and uh, take us through his first case. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a 10 years old boy who came to us about one year after the injury, now has about 15 degrees of genu valgum in the left side. So, do we have uh, the poll, how to proceed? Do we have the poll? Can we have the first poll, Ashok? Yes, sir. Please start voting. What do you feel? How would you proceed? Do you think you need just an observation here and things would remodel? Do you think uh, this child needs more imaging? Or do you think he needs an osteotomy? Or you will be generous enough to refer to one of us? So a few more seconds more. Yes, Dr. Wong, what do you feel uh, here? Yeah, let's see the results. So 55% have said uh, that it requires more imaging. So Dr. Wong, what do you feel? Uh, So I'll prefer more imaging, preferably so MRI. what sort of imaging uh, you think would be appropriate here? Uh, MRI. Okay. Just, yeah. So we got a CT done and it did show a physial bar there. And subsequently we got an MRI as well. And that showed the physial bar. So, how would you proceed further? So, do, do, you, do you have the facial measurements, the size of the no, facial? Uh, we Unfortunately, uh, it was uh, not uh, there in the software. So, the, the radiologist was not able to do the facial bar mapping. Okay. But it doesn't but look like that. This is a huge one. This, this uh, it look, doesn't it look like, like but I think it's around, around 15% or 20%. So, yeah. would you consider so, a, a oxygen? Yeah, I think this is a central bar, um, yeah. eccentrically located, and that's why it gives you some shortening as well as a, a vulgus deformity. Um, so I think that would be a good case for uh, facial bar excisions. And it's really up to you whether you want to, how much is the general vulgum? How bad is it? It's around 15 degrees. Yeah, 15 degrees, age 10, I think there's no harm trying growth modulation at the same time, putting a page on the medial side, and then uh, after, af I mean, after the physial bar excision. Okay. So you plan for a physial bar excision as well as a eight plate. So sure, we did this. So we did the physial bar excision and put a eight plate on the contralateral side of the femur. And... This is a two years uh, follow up. A and very beautiful correction. Growth modulation, yeah. So, this yeah. is uh, the beautiful correction. So, uh, uh, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Saw, uh, I want to ask you at what point of time would you remove the plate? Do you feel there, would be, there could be a rebound phenomena or uh, do you remove the plate when, you, when the things are getting corrected? I mean, when the things are corrected fully? 
Now, usually, I think if the child is still growing, we just remove one of the screw. If you are using a plate, it is very expensive. We just remove the metaphyseal screw. So if it really rebounds, we can put it back. So if there is still, if it's near to skeletal maturity, then maybe it is okay. So it depends on what age you are looking at. So if it rebounds, how much, by how much degree do you think it rebounds? And uh, in which cases do you feel, do you have any predictors for the rebound? Uh, I, I actually don't have that much experience on uh, removing during that stage because most of the patients are having quite severe deformity. I, I usually just, as long as there are still, uh, still growth, I would like to have an overcorrection of about 5 degrees or so. And then it probably can come back. Yeah. But there is no real, I think, guideline. It depends on many other factors. Yeah, general experience says that about five degrees of overcorrection should be done. Can mm -hmm. we go to the next slide? So, uh, this was an article from uh, uh, General of Clinical Orthopedic and Trauma, which says that they have a very small series of five cases. The rate of correction is around 0.9 degrees. Uh, per month and the physial bar resection plus uh, tension band hemipapophysiotesis is a good option for correction of angular deformities with physal. And once eight plate is removed, uh, rebound occurs. Where to go in for a bar resection, usually the best results are with a bar of less than 25% of the total uh, area of the growth plate. You can go up to 30, but after 30, the results are not too great. One should be sure that there should be minimum of two years of growth remaining. Otherwise, uh, bar resection is not a good exercise. And the angular deformity should usually be less than 20 degrees. And you can go in younger children, maybe up to about 25 degrees. And if it is more than 25 degrees, then you have to correct, use a corrective osteotomy along with Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. We have one question from uh, participants. I would like Dr. Tejun uh, Chow to answer this. What type of imaging uh, MR sequence would you use to image Faisal Bar? So you were talking about uh, uh, PET scan. Uh, we want a basic question to be answered. What type of MR sequence would you advise when you are imaging Faisal Bar? Dr. Tejun Chow, are you there? Dr. Wang, can you answer that question? I think um, the, the 3D spoiled um, echo sequence with fat suppression give you the best uh, imaging result for the physics. Okay. Thank you. I think that should be a, a satisfaction for the participants. Okay, let's go to the uh, uh, second. Sorry, uh, Pramal, before you move uh, uh, to, I think uh, Avisha's point is very, very good. Uh, when While you code those 25 degrees or 20 degree angular deformity, you must really be very clear whether it's around the knee or around the ankle because two of them have a different prognosis. Yes, I think it's a, when you are talking about a growing physis and a non-growing physis, the degree cannot be the same thing. I completely agree with you. So That's let's good. go to this uh, second case. Uh, this is a common physal injury. Uh, this is a type of alpha Harris injury, uh, minimally displaced fracture. Um, and this is the post-operative x-ray. So uh, this was treated uh, with close reduction and uh, percutaneous screw fixation. So I want you to uh, comment on this type of fixation. Uh, Ashok, can we have the second opinion, please? What do you feel? This is an excellent treatment. And would you discharge the child once you get a bony healing? Would you, do you think this is a bad reduction and will you re-reduce it? Do you think this reduction is good, but fixation requires some additional screws and more compression? And what do you feel? This is a reasonable treatment, but this child needs longer follow. Yes, James, what do you feel? What is your answer? Professor James, can you answer? 
Okay, I think uh, eighty-one percent has uh, felt that it's a reasonable treatment, but child needs longer follow-up. Uh, Atul, what do you feel here? Doctor, Doctor Evelyn, I think Atul is not there. Can you answer the question? Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I think this is a reasonable treatment right now. It's an intraarticular fracture, and the most important thing here is to re restore the articular surface. And there's nothing you can do about the original trauma. And in fact, this is a pretty good fixation because you pass two screws um, away from the physis. There's nothing crossing the physis. But definitely, this crosses the germinal zone or the resting zone of the physis, and this, is, this can potentially cause a physial arrest, so you definitely need longer follow-up. So uh, what would you tell the parents before you uh, go ahead in the operating room and uh, fix this thing? I would tell them that we have to fix the our, uh, fracture anatomically because this is also an, an articular, an interarticular injury. Uh, but afterwards, they need to be well prepared that uh, this can lead to physial arrest. And so this child will come back for long-term follow-up every few months initially and then once yearly. And uh, if we do see any evidence of physical arrest, such as angular deformities, we will proceed with more imaging such as MRI and then proceed accordingly. Okay. So this is what happened. Um, Atul, uh, what do you think uh, has happened here? And do you think you could have prevented it? No, I think uh, because we didn't have an MRI pre-op, so whether this was uh, most likely the damage that has occurred during the time of injury, and this is not uncommon. Distal femur has got the highest incidence of, uh, of fascial arrest of, among all the bones. So, you know, I don't think it can be iatrogenic since it was done percutaneously. However, uh, if there's a periosteal entrapment and in, in type 4, the incidence is even higher. So, uh, in retrospect, one can think that it could have been uh, prevented had it been done open. But again, uh, you know, this is a, unless you have information pre op, in hindsight, you cannot inform the parents this, uh, this is iatrogenic. So, I would counsel them, as Evelyn has mentioned, they need thorough follow-up. And if you've seen, uh, you look for early signs, and when you see early signs, uh, you remove the metal, uh, and then you do an MRI scan. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of artifacts in this area. Uh, can I add something on this? Yes, Dr. So I, actually, I was going to ask you, do you think that MRI relatively would have been helpful in this study? I do not think so. When I was uh, putting my conclusion, on telling the families about this bone factory, I was really referring to this fracture. The rate of uh, this uh, physial arrest is about near to 40% in this case. The reason, no, people postulated two possible reasons. One is because this part, the bone grow very fast. It just grow across. Second, second is because the area, the surface area, there's no other surface area so broad as this. Any small part, the bone can just have injury. They will just grow across. So even Salter Harris 1, Salter Harris 2, you may have growth arrest for distal femur. So I don't think it's, uh, whatever investigation you have done earlier would have changed. And most likely, it would have occurred due to injury itself. So in fact, the message is that for distal, uh, distal femur fracture, whatever type of classification do you have? Remember to tell parents that this may happen. Yeah. I think that's a very good summary, Doctor. Uh, so I, I think this is what I think there are certain factors in uh, factors in which you want to talk before rather than after the surgery. And that will save a lot of trouble to you. And this is one such fracture. So um, as uh, we have seen in earlier slide also, this is a paper from General Pediatric Orthopedics which has imaged uh, distal femur at various ages and found that the distal femur is... Uh, very uh, undulating physis. So whenever you have even have got a type 1 injury, the injury can be in a different zones of uh, uh, physial cartilage. So it can, sometimes it can be only in the hypertrophic zone, but in certain parts it can be in the germinal zone as well. And if you have a germinal zone vascular injury, there is a very high chances of uh, growth arrest. Uh, incidentally, uh, the still femur is undulated in a lot of other animals. As we have seen in slides of Dr. Uh, uh, James, Mice, rabbit, this giraffe, and this antelope also 
they show that there's a very ragged uh, appearance of the distal femur and whenever there's an injury to distal femoral physis, uh, more than 40 or certain series, there are 60% chances of growth arrest. So whenever, unfortunately, you are involved in a treating distal femur injury, the message from us would be that you talk to the parents on day one, be it a type one injury, be it type two injury, more so in type three and type four injury. Yes, Dr. Tijun uh, Cho, you want to add something to this or should we move next? Yeah, let's move on to the next. You described very well, explained very well. So this I will add, I will add one, one point. You know, if you go to the first slide on, the, on that patient, you know, the lower screw, uh, if you look at the length of the screw, was, was pretty long. And I can tell you that, you know, from... I had a patient that was treated by someone else, you know, really good fixation, but the length of the screw was longer, the patient had a lot of pain because you know it's right against the MCL and had a lot of stiffness. The patient came to me, I just removed the screw and he was so happy. So, I mean, you know, when you're fixing these fractures, you have to pay attention to details. Like a longer screw on this side, on the medial side, would be significantly irritating your, your, uh, your joint. You may end up with more stiffness. Just a point to be made. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're bang on. And, uh, but fortunately this uh, guy has uh, overgrown here. And the screw is now intra-osseous. <laughs> intra anyway, uh, I think it's most important thing is the distal femur. We need to take it absolutely seriously. It's not your fault always that if the bar can happen. It's a decided preoperative. So let's go to this unusual TBL physial injury. Uh, this was a four-year-old male. And this is the open road traffic injury. And this is the foot injury in which there was a missing uh, metatarsal. There was a missing distal fibula. And uh, this is how uh, exposed uh, ankle was on the lateral side. Uh, I can enlarge you for this is like this. And I would like you to vote for this injury. Um, can we have the um, opinion poll, Ashok? Do you think uh, you will be able to classify this injury from uh, what has been uh, told to uh, you by Dr. Um, earlier? Do you think this is an absent fibula with no injury to tibula, tibia? Or uh, this is absent fibula with some type of physal injury? Or do you think more imaging is required? Yes, yeah, Sheetal, what do you feel here till we get the answer? You know, I mean, you know, it's easy to choose that more imaging is, is required. But honestly, I don't think that it's going to change your treatment. You have to undergo this patient, you have to debride. And, you know, anything, any information that you get from advanced imaging may not help you with the treatment because, you know, it, it seems like you're missing your lateral physis of the distal tibia. And that is going to be an issue. It's, it's you know, it's your, uh, uh, you know, it's not a salt of Harris classification like it was, uh, you know, explained uh, earlier. But uh, so, as I said, it's easier to just recommend imaging. I don't know if imaging is going to change your treatment. So suppose, um, uh, Sheetal, if you had to uh, tackle this injury on day one, uh, what would you look on the lateral aspect of the TBI? And how would you uh, address uh, that issue? Well, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a tough uh, problem. You know, this, uh, uh, once your, your main aim here is your infection and wound healing first. So once you make sure that you have debrided enough, you have a coverage, you have wound healing, then you have to anticipate, you know, uh, a valgus deformity. There is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there is an acute Langenskiol procedure that could be done where you can graft, like take the periosteum off and you can graft it to prevent uh, a growth uh, arrest, which is expected out of this. But, you know, with the fibula missing and with so much of, uh, you know, lateral structure damage, it might just go into valgus irrespective of what you do, you know, then you'll have to correct it later on. But acutely, there is a role of doing a Langenskiol procedure, which is uh, fat grafting in the area of the physis. The physis would be exposed, I would guess. Yeah, so fortunately, even 10 years down the line, this child doesn't have any ankle uh, subluxation. But if you can look at, there is a significant growth on the medial side and lateral side, uh, there is very little growth. Uh, this is how the child looks 10 years down the line. Some missing toes, significant ankle valgus, a lot of skin graft taken. And probably this is type six injury. I also refer to the same book as uh, Dr. Evelyn has uh, quoted. It's a wonderful book about uh, physial injury. And this tells us that, uh, that uh, this is the injury to the type six perichondrial ring of lacrosse is the area where the injury takes place. So this type six injury is basically injury to zone of Ranvier, may not be associated with a major fracture. It can be associated with a localized contusion or evolution of the portion of the physis. It 
general result from a glancing type of trauma which involves evolution of the soft tissue it can be a bicycle injury or a lawn mower injury more so in the west which we don't see here sometimes it can be a result of a traumatically induced infection or severe burns or radiation and frequent peripheral osseous bar formation is likely and that can lead to progressive angular deformity because it is always a lateral or a medial bar Uh, the treatment recommended is meticulous debridement, but you should not suture the periosteum back because if you suture it, there are very high chances that peripheral bleeding will take place. That is what is very little literature available for uh, this type of fracture. So this child uh, uh, presented to me like this, ten years down the line, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Tejan Cho, how would you proceed from here? Now I think ten years down the line, a uh, child is about. Uh, Uh, 15 years, hardly much growth left, and this is uh, his uh, clinical picture. Uh, this is her, still some more clinical pictures. This is poor ankle movements. Basically, is moving somewhere at uh, talonavicular joint, and this is his uh, scanogram. So this is basically femoral as well as uh, tibial shortening. Yes, the shortening and ankle valves. You should give the rest, and then uh, there's a, a scar on the lateral aspect of the ankle. So I would. Correct the distal ankle by acute correction, and then lengthen the uh, tibia. The proximal lengthen the tibia at the proximal side. Yeah. So would you do it uh, all single stage, or you would stage it ankle first, followed by lengthening? Uh, the, the, the simultaneous correction may be possible. I prefer. I would prefer to use a circular external fixator to correct the distal ankle more more accurately. So we did something like this. Uh, we acutely corrected ankle. I uh, used a guided um, a small nail to hold a little bit of this, and then lengthen like this. Maintain the ankle to prevent any deformity in long-term splint. This is few weeks down the line. We over lengthened the tibia because there was some femoral shortening also. Yeah, so we over lengthened the uh, tibia <coughs> centimeters. That's a two-year follow-up. That's his uh, functional result. And this is how he walks uh, without splints now, but uh, he is encouraged to use splints uh, uh, more often when he is going outside. Dr. Soik, would you have done something different in this case? Yes, Dr. Cho, you wanted to say something. Sorry. Uh, maybe go back to the slides after ten years, maybe. Yeah, before the reconstruction, the X-ray. Before that, before. Back the forward, backward. Yes, this X-ray. Yeah, this X-ray. Uh, the distal tibial epiphysis is triangular shape. That is very evident. But uh, I wonder whether the fascia is really uh, arrested at the lateral side. It is. Uh, if you look at the fascia uh, alignment to the longitudinal axis of the tibia, it is not so much in valgus. So the, yes. if fascia is arrested laterally, it should be more. Uh, valgus, the fascis should be inclined more. So, oh, cool. valgus, is, uh, valgus has come from triangular shape of epiphysis, which is not because of the fascial arrest, but because of the some kind of epiphysial uh, the, the, the male growth, uh, probably because of uh, absence of a fibula. Okay, so, Dr. Cho, I would like to comment something on this, because we see many conditions, other conditions, which uh, show this type of epiphysis deformity. All yes. the, lateral, the lateral ray deficiencies from fibula hemimilia, fibula yeah. pseudo- Myelomeningocele. Yes, and also fibula osteomyelitis, but those congenital problems like fibula hemimilia, as well as pseudoarthrosis of the fibula. Yes. When yes. the lateral ray is deficient, invariably the distal tibia epiphysis will appear like that. So yeah. I don't think it is due to purely due to facial arrest. It may be some other factors that it will grow into valgus position, and not necessarily due to an arrest. But if you consider But how the epiphysis grow, it does not grow at the facies. It grows from the secondary ossification center. So right. facies has nothing to do with the shape of epiphysis. So I think the triangular shape of epiphysis is secondary to some kind of lateral uh, the defect, like oh, a correct. absence of fibula. Yes, and that's my point. Yeah. yeah. Then how about do you sorry? How do you explain the shortening? 
of tibia. Yes, yes that's quite seven centimeters. centimeters. Yeah, probably the whole whole uh, distal tibial epiphysis may uh, the physical growth may be uh, may not so good, but uh, it is not so much. Uh, the, it's not partial physical arrest. Well, I think it's a combination of factors. If you look at the X-ray carefully look, and and look at the alignment of the proximal tibial physis and the distal tibial physis, they are not so much in vulgus. I agree with that, Hagen. If, it, if this is still due, due to growth arrest, you will see more vulgus alignments of the distal tibial physis. Anyway, coming back to the management, uh, I would agree with uh, Prof. Cho. I will do acute correction on distal part, but I will use ring fixator so that the osteotomy can be more distal. So they will get more better anatomical realignment. Then I will do lengthening on the metaphys uh, or on the shaft on top at the same time. Acute correction at the bottom and then lengthening over the shaft at the same time. Now, just a bit of comment on the correction. I think it's better to do an over correction. So there is a slight like a thrust over the medial side because you will have a medial malleoli uh, as sort of an anchor. I think Draw Pali always mentioned that when we do fibula hemimilia, always over correcting in a while so that the, the talus can slide towards the area where you have an anchor. So slightly over correction a bit into varus. I taken Dr. Ike. Uh, uh, we move on to the third case. I invite Dr. Atul uh, to present this case. It's a very unique case of uh, femoral plating. Atul, can you unmute yourself and take over? Yeah, so this is a child which was seen by Dr. Rajuta. So it's her case. Uh, it's an eight year old boy who sustained a fracture of the shaft of the left femur in the lower third and he was treated by, by plating. Uh, next slide, please. So this was the uh, post of x-rays and the scar there. Uh, a fairly long plate was used and you can see that the fracture has, has, has healed. And uh, anybody wants to guess what would happen uh, to this child? Uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Wang, uh, what would you think, what would you anticipate when you do low plating of the lower third of the femur with you know, soft tissue stripping? Any, anything you want to counsel the parents? Uh, there's a chance that the, there will be excessive a stripping around the distal, the lateral part of the femoral physis, and that will cause a damage with a growth arrest. All right, next slide, please. Let's go. Move, let's move forward. So anyway, this child had a screw going through the physis, which was removed. They had confirmed that on the MRI scan, um, and this screw was then removed. Um, next slide, please. And this was the uh, six months after implant removal. You can see there is a. Uh, some changes on the uh, lateral side. Uh, there was an MRI scan done, there was no uh, CT scan done and there was no facial mapping done because there was no software available. But there was a lateral tether which was confirmed on the MRI scan. And another question is, uh, how do you proceed? Because the parents are quite livid that four, six months uh, after the fracture, the uh, deformity has, has occurred and now the child is uh, having this kind of appearance of valgus deformity, almost 15 degrees of valgus. Um, 15, 20 degrees of vulgar. So what do you do? So these are the options which uh, anybody who want to guess what would be the best option for this choice, this, this child, whether... Can we, we have fourth poll, please? Is there a wording? Uh, yeah, okay. So, so what is the age of the patient? So this child is eight years old. So eight years and six months now after implant removal. So either you do a peripheral bar excision, you do an ostotomy, uh, bar excision with goat modulation, uh, combination of excision, ostotomy, and modulation, or something else, something unique like uh, James would want to do some cartilage transplant or stem cells or something. So eight and eight and a half years, uh, six months post injury, uh, twenty degree valgus deformity. So seventy percent uh, opted for bar excision and growth modulation, and I think uh, that's the correct choice. So next slide, please. So this was done uh, simple. Uh, so here the, there was no bar excision done to be honest. They just did a eight plate. Only an eight plate, plate was done. There was no bar excision. And uh, you see this child had fall up at one and a half years. The egg, the plate is diverging. And you can see that the correction is occurring. So there was no bar excision done. 
uh, simply a, a, a eight plate. And sometimes one can get this kind of correction by just uh, stopping the the tethering on the middle side by putting a plate on the opposite side. So it can kind of uh, stimulate the physis. But this is not unusual. This is a uh, this is what the eight year follow up. Uh, this is there's no rebound valgus. Uh, so any comments from uh, from the panel? Uh, yeah, in uh, you know the valgus after plating. Um, even in absence of tether, so I don't know how much the tether had to do with it, but in the reported series, you know, from Boston, you know, they had reported about 30%, uh, you know, uh, patients who had uh, uh, femur fracture and were plated were going into valgus. And it's not about the tether, it's, you know, it's it's not the tether at the growth plate, it's, you know, it's the theory is that you may be tethering the soft tissues or the periosteum on the lateral side, that might be giving rise to valgus, but you need to you know, inform the family, you know, preoperatively that valgus is common after plating for distal third femur fracture, it has been reported and that has been the experience. And that's why uh, people choose to remove the plate after the fracture is healed, but still you, you may end up with what you had. I agree with you, Sheetal, that, uh, you know, sometimes it's the, the uh, vascular insult it, that itself can cause due to stripping and not the, not actually the bar formation. I mean, the MRI, if you look at it uh, retrospectively, there wasn't really a very significant uh, uh, bar formation there. And that's why I think the growth plate worked. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, it wouldn't have worked like this. Yeah, no, the valgus that, that, that has been reported, it, it is after lateral plating, not even close to the physis. You are above the physis and you right. still have valgus. So there's nothing to do with the, so the, the valgus comes from the physis, but it's not because of, a, uh, because, because of an iatrogenic injury to the physis. Right. Sheetal, okay. do you think that uh, this uh, I guess was due to uh, eight plate at site of uh, growth modulation which was happening on the lateral side? Probably uh, it was like a growth plate applied on the uh, lateral side so it allowed medial physis to grow. It happened in valgus and that remained there when the plate was put on the medial side, it corrected. Yeah, no, that is what has been reported as well. You know, that you don't need to do osteotomies or don't need to do advanced you, you know, if you have more than 10, 10 degrees, I would say, of, of, of valgus, then growth modulation would work because the physis is normal. You know, there, it's not because of a physal arrest. Right. So, Dr. Evelyn, would you have done something different? Suppose this patient had come to you immediately uh, with the screw um, uh, removed, say, three months down the line, would you have done something different? I, I absolutely agree with what everything, what uh, everyone has said so far, in the sense that the MRI does not show an actual bony bridge. It's not your typical um, bony bar. And so I agree, maybe it's just tethering or scarring of the periosteum and the soft tissues around the uh, lateral side. Having said that though, um, this is, you can say it's iatrogenic. Um, this is something that was caused by the initial plate. And so, Yes, in the long run, this case turned out fine, but I think um, you have to discuss with the patients very carefully. Uh, growth modulation worked in this case, but I think I would have been a bit more aggressive on the lateral side. I might have, Ashley, you're right, opened it up and maybe seen, actually just taking a look at the soft tissues in the periosteum to see if there was any scarring that could be removed. So actually, interestingly, this child uh, was seen by me also. I had advised uh, MRI imaging and I had warned them that they may need physial bar excision. So they moved away and they went to Rujuta. She was very lucky to get it uh, with a simple <laughs> eight plate and the wonderful follow up of this case uh, she has made. Okay, so uh, let's go to this uh, uh, ghasti injury of distal tibia where there was an ankle dislocation um, and uh, somehow um, this was the x ray which uh, showed a lot of things, but uh, somehow the doctor felt that there was a need for a CT scan. So uh, what do you think, Dr. Tejun Cho? Do you think uh, the CT scan was warranted in an emergency open situation like this? <laughs> uh, you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Cho, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, it is unusual for us to take a CT in the emergency uh, case like this. Okay, I, I understand. Well, you know, that a, a CT scan would help, but you know, once you in, do an initial debridement and reduce the uh, ankle, and then you do a CT scan, it will be more helpful because then you can exactly plan your definitive fixation. Yes, yes, agree. Okay, so this is what was the fixation done. And uh, this was the radiological uh, thing. So I would like uh, people to answer uh, what do they think about this fixation? 
do they think that this is a perfect fixation or they would have delayed the malleolar fixation at the second stage as um, sheetal felt or do you think the malleolar screw would have been ideal and do you feel that tension band wire should not have been used here what is the feeling please start voting yes james what do you think what should have been done what would you have done here no, i have done i have done the i i don't think uh i think the injury is so severe that uh whether you put tension band or not uh um does not uh affect the ultimate uh, so called fissure arrest i i think the fissure arrest probably occur as a result of original injury no sir what would you have used tension band wiring or would you have used something else i i, I don't think it matters here because i think the damage is really you had you had you had operated this on day one what fixation method would you have used I I I mean I wouldn't use the tension band, but uh, I really warn parents about the, you know, all the possible. Uh, you look at the CT scan; they like really, really, really uh, bad injury there. So I would just stabilize it with a wire. But I think you warn parents about uh, the possible damage at the uh, uh, distal tibial fissures. The sheetal, I think you might be seeing this open fissural injuries more often than we do. We don't see that much often uh, fissural open fissural injuries. So how would you treat this on day one? I think that's the more important than how you uh, treat the complications. No, I agree with James. You know, the the fate is decided for the medial malleolus fracture because of the injury. The more important things for me is to you know make sure we don't have infection. We have proper wound coverage. You know, if needed, an X fix would be like what you have used. i would be less concerned about the malleolar fixation on day 1 but if given a chance like you know if everything looks okay in the or i don't you know it's not contaminated i'm pretty confident i don't need to come back and the i put a you know uh, and the wound can be covered or something then putting a k wire or screw around the medial malleolus not transfisal but trying to fix it would be my choice i wouldn't do a tension band but as james said you know this is a very high risk uh, fracture for for growth arrest and my primary in uh, you know purpose of treating this patient would be to take care of the wound and infection and uh, trying to prevent those problems first so i think again everybody is reiterating and reinforcing that uh, uh, the discussion pre operative is very important in such patients because here you can actually visualize that this child is going to go for uh, a virus because of the median malleolus growth arrest because there is a significant growth there so i think that's a very important take home message that before you bank on starting treatment in fissural injury it is very good that you sit with the parents and discuss that uh, what is a uh, likely outcome and how long they are going to be with you in the for the line of the treatment uh, uh, Pram pramal i like to add, add, add to what you say i think in treating fissural injuries uh, the age of the surgeon certainly matter because why we all behave that way because a lot of us must have been caught when we were younger once and then you find that 3 months down the road and you know it probably occur or something fissure arrest occur and then you are you look like an idiot you know what i mean that's so, why precisely i have chosen the cases in in which you know uh, the things didn't go as planned so let me go further as um, as uh, as already been said uh, by dr wang cho the covering converging park harris growth line tells us that there is a medial malleolus growth harris which was actually pre operatively almost guessed by all the faculties this is how she presented to me that's uh, imaging and this is how uh, she was treated and as uh, dr tejun cho say um, has felt that i felt that here uh, fat graft won't be possible so this is where you can see you can see the clear cartilage all around so there was a good clearance this is the fissure line this is how the fissure line you will see that's the bone up that's the medial less malleolus bone down and uh, this is how uh, the defect was filled with uh, polymethylmethylmethic relet uh, uh, cement because i do i i knew that if i put a fat here it won't stay there because the soft tissues were also scarred in that area so this is my only use of uh, pmmc in sergey and it does not generate heat so it doesn't uh, 
damage the physis nearby and it's, it's a radiologically um, nuisance. So you, you don't, you, your x-rays are also not affected. So it looks somewhat like this in on post-operative x-ray. Yes, Tejun Cho, uh, you seem to have experience with uh, PMMC. So um, what, what would you say about uh, this type of uh, feeling material? Yes, uh, I'm going to use the bone cement, but I don't know what is a PMMC, but we are using the, the uh, cranioplast. Yeah, that's, is, the, that's the name here we use as PMMC, polymethyl okay. cement. It's supposed to uh, produce less heat, yes, but actually yes. they produce uh, the substantial heat during the, the, the reaction. So we have to irrigate with ice cold uh, the saline continuously yes. until it uh, comes down. And uh, so uh, this child, uh, this was the immediate post-operative. She, she had a little bit of spray and over a period of time, um, that spray stopped. So my physial bar excision was uh, not very successful, but fortunately she did not have any increase in the deformity because uh, this was not in the growing part of the bone. And uh, this is how she is walking. So this was actually told on day one to the parents. That's why the parents have continued following up because um, I want you to go away not with an idea that Faisal bar excision gives always a good result. Contrary to that, um, this was a paper from American Journal of Radiology where they found that the distal tibia post-traumatic growth were one of the most common thing which they were uh, referred. And uh, this... Uh, a review article in Canadian Journal with 12 uh, children, uh, average is 10. Actually, four of them had Salter Harris 2 injury. Only one had Salter Harris 3, six had Salter Harris 4, and one had Salter Harris 5 injury. Open fractures were four, and high energy in injuries were five. There were only five sem uh, sem uh, uh, simple physical bars, and only three patients had physical bar excision. So this I want to say is that physical bar excision is not uh, a treatment which is always followed. There are many other treatments, including observation, which you can do. And if you are not very confident of doing physical uh, bar excision surgery, it may be a good idea to have your colleague, uh, colleague along with you. This is a second paper which has showed that uh, there was a significant problem of 14 patients who had a distal tibial bar excision um, in which there was... Uh, Five patients had recurrence of bar. There was, uh, in less than one year, there was a bridge recurrence. And on MRCT, which was done post-operatively, uh, there was actually graft dislocation and recurrence of bar in three cases. So MRI has been used post-operatively as well to um, image whether you are successful in treating uh, physical bars or not. So pre-operative MRI as well as post-operative MRI and maybe re-surgery is also warranted. Yes, Dr. Dr. Premal, Dr. Yes, Premal, yes, in Dr. hindsight, in hindsight, would you have added a fibular screw? Um, fibular, distal fibular physiodesis. Would you yeah, have done that? I think I should have done that. You know, uh, Premal, I would have done an osteotomy along with this, you know, uh, along with the physiodesis because of the deformity that the patient had. So, you know, that would be, uh, that is what I would have, uh, have done. And you know, just uh, just a couple of points. What I would not do, and it wasn't done in this case, but I've seen it being done, is one is putting a transarticular pin to hold the ankle in position when you first see an ankle dislocation like that. I've seen that. I would not recommend because that not only damages the articular surface but also the physis. But I've seen that being treated with a transarticular pin from the heel into the tibia to hold the ankle in place. So an X fix is a much better option. And number two is not treating the medial malleolus is not a good option because it does tend to migrate proximally and heal in a very bad position that itself would cause a physial arrest because the epiphysis is going to heal to the metaphysis. I've seen that as well where we had to do an osteotomy and bring it back. So not treating medial malleolus and using transarticular pins are not good options. You know, external fixator and fixing the medial malleolus is the right answer because even if it goes into a growth arrest, you still have the options of doing a bar excision and uh, doing uh, the, uh, the osteotomies. But if you damage articular surface, then you don't have too many options, like a, like a big step off at the articular surface or iatrogenic injury by putting a pins across, you are causing permanent damage, which is irreversible. And just add one more thing to this discussion, just very quickly. I think for the listeners out there, it's very important to understand that when you have an angular deformity after a partial physial arrest, 
you actually have two problems. One is the, the bar, which is causing the tethering. And the second is the deformity. So when you do the physial bar excision, you've only addressed the first problem. You haven't fixed the deformity. It doesn't, it won't catch up somehow afterwards, which is why you have to add, you have to think about that second problem. For example, in the distal femur, because there's so much growth left, growth modulation often works. But as we've already said in the chat group, the distal tibia has much less growth remaining for, for, for patients. And so for, I completely agree with Dr. Chital, I would do the osteotomy for this patient because it's the distal tibia. And I know that um, growth modulation by putting a screw through the distal fibula probably won't correct much of the deformity. So I think the listeners have to understand that when this happens, you actually have to fix two things and you have to think about the two, two problems that you have to address. I completely agree with you. I think we should have added a, a osteotomy in there. Um, so let's go to this child. This is a one year, uh, seven months old child. Um, complaint of bow leg on the right side. He had a fall before one month and did not walk for a few days, but improved uh, with rest. But he did have history of um, ICU admission at birth and had IV antibiotic for eight days. And uh, this is how uh, he came to me with this x-ray, uh, metaphysial changes. And this is how it looked in an AP view. So, and when I did an MRI, this is what, this is what was the picture, right? So can we have uh, one, another opinion poll? Uh, what do you think participants here feel that do you, should you go for Faisal bar excision? Or you should add metaphysial corrective osteotomy as advised by bar excision plus growth modulation or you do full monty bar excision supracondylar uh, sorry metaphysial osteotomy and growth modulation so we have take us for all the options and majority person people say that they go for bar excision and growth modulation okay um yes dr ike what would you do what would be your choice this is a significant angular deformity uh, if you look no. at this child okay that's a significant okay. angular deformity now first of all i'm not really very sure whether the fall contributes to this so I usually we not Usually, we do not do MRI for children. I'm considering whether it's blounds or not. I have to say, we don't do uh, MRI for blounds. So, I don't know whether these contribute to this. But from the x-ray, there are some defect over there still, you know. Because a blount is also a medial physial deficiency. So, whether a blount can cause this or not, I'm not very sure. But for the treatment-wise, I would uh, now... Uh, how old is the child? Huh? Now is he's more than, more than two? Pardon? No, he's at two now. A little less than two. Oh, less than two. Okay. So usually, if it is about two years old or more than two, we consider this is possibly blount disease. And I will correct the deformity rather than dealing with the, what they call, physio plate. Generally, I know somebody will do uh, epiphyseal disease for Blau disease, but I don't think it's very safe in the children so small like this. Uh, on the other hand, if it is like what we see here, there is a physical injury, I do not have experience of doing this physical correction for such a young kid. I'm afraid we may induce more injury. Maybe other experts may have some opinion on this. Yeah. Sheetal, uh, would you like to take on this child? Probably has infective bar or I don't, I don't think it's a traumatic bar, but it can be an infective bar from the childhood sepsis. So, you know, I agree with, uh, you know, Dr. Shaw's, uh, you know, point about this, you know, appears to be more like a blount changes rather than true, uh, you know, infection or a, a physical injury. Uh, you know, irrespective, uh, you know, at two, probably, even if you want to wait a little bit for let it grow and show you what it has. But, you know, you start thinking about surgical treatment right around that age. Anything younger than that, you can try and, you know, uh, see if you wanted to use, you know, a brace uh, for a while, just to, just to let the child develop a little bit more. Uh, I, You know, bar excision in such a young child, you know, I'm not too much convinced that uh, it's going to be uh, helpful. Like, you know, we don't do it 
in, in blouns. Uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, how much, uh, you know, even if you excise it, you know, if, it, if there is infection, there is sick physis. So what do you, you know, if you excise the bar, doesn't mean that you have done the job because remaining physis may still be affected and you may not get what you want. I do agree that the deformity needs to be corrected. So, you know, just like blouns, we would be very aggressive doing osteotomies early on to correct deformities. Uh, you know, you can consider the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, modulation, but uh, I, would, I would be more inclined towards osteotomy at around two and a half, three years of age to correct it. I'm not convinced about, you know, excising the bar, it's gonna be uh, helpful. Yeah. So what I did was I did an osteotomy and did uh, excision of the bar as well. Dr. Tejun Cho, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I, uh, to in, in general, agree with uh, Dr. Shital the, and then, um, I think that it, it may not be trauma. Trauma has, uh, I mean, falling down has nothing to do with uh, this uh, the pathology. And uh, if you look at the MRI, it is not blunt because there's some something between the epiphysis and metaphysis, but this is not bony bridge. There's no bridge between the epiphysis and metaphysis. Just the gross plate is coming down to the, into the metaphysis. I believe that is uh, the sequelae of infection in neonatal period. So the in infection sequelae, the, actually there is no bone breaching. Then uh, in many cases in my uh, practice, they do not progress so much. They uh, stay in that deformity for a long time. So uh, in that age, before two years of age, I would apply the brace uh, just like uh, blunt uh, patients and then wait whether it aggravate or progress or not. So, yeah, that would be my choice. I did not select any any choice in the poll. Yeah. So uh, I think I thought this was an infective bar. Yes, James, you want to say something? Uh, Pramal, can you go back to MRI? Yeah, I, I'm glad that Tejun said that. Uh, I'd like to point out to, to everyone that um, there's no depression or plateau here. Neither do you see the hypertrophic meniscus, which tend to associate it with blounts on MRI, uh, Chitao, do you agree with me on that? So, and yeah, James, uh, one, one, one more thing I would like to add is we rarely see blood So that's never our first diagnosis. Atul, do you, how often do you see infantile browns? I'm, I'm very rare to see. Yeah, very rare in our country actually to see. So we don't consider that as a first option. When there is a neonatal sepsis, I think the first right. thing to our mind is... Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, and I like to point out why, uh, because I've seen uh, enough MRI of the blounds to to say this is not a, uh, it does not have all the features of uh, uh, blounds on of MRI. Yeah. You know, the James, the reason I was saying what I'm saying is the appearance is like blounds. I would treat it rather like blounds than treating like a physiotherapist. Is what I was trying to say. So the, uh, for blounds, you know, what we do is we do bracing early on. We wait a little bit and then do an osteotomy as needed. We don't do physal bar resection. Whereas yeah. for injuries, we do physal bar resection. So, so what I was trying to say is that our approach is more, more like blounts when it comes to these patients, you know, with infection. Yeah. Because you cannot, you don't know doing anything on the physis. It may be the sick physis and the entire physis may be sick, not the ones that appears to be sick, but even the, the entire physis may be sick. So you can't expect it to grow like the way you would expect with growth modulation. That's why I think an osteotomy would be a better choice, you know, for, for these patients. So what I did was uh, we did an osteotomy and uh, through that I did a drilling and uh, then put a graft there. This is how the fixation was done and this is how it looked at uh, six week post-op. Yes, Sheetal, your comments. It was similar treatment, but I did add, uh, say, uh, bar oxygen. No, I think that looks good, you know, to, to me. I mean, I would, uh, if I have to do an osteotomy, then it, it looks a uh, little bit uh, like funny on the x-rays, but I think that's what, uh, that's what you need to do. Yeah, but, uh, unfortunately, eight months down the line, the child came back with the deformity. Yeah. No, I thought, uh, Pramal, when you do your, uh, you know, when Chawan say that when you do your osteotomy, then you get to visualize your bar very well. So I thought you managed to... Yeah, but, uh, I mean, I was very, very uncomfortable going very close to such a growing physis. I didn't want to damage the anterior physis as well. So this is what I got. So now what do you think should I do? I got some options for you. Can we start? Uh, 
opinion poll here. Now that we are stuck, we have got a repeat deformity. We have already excised the bar. We have already done the osteotomy. What will you do? Ah, then do your growth modulation then. <laughs> so you can answer that. <laughs> How old is the patient now? Now three years. Three years. Three years. Dr. Cho, what would you choose now? Suppose no. I refer the child to you, what will you do? Nothing to choose. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> wait, wait. My answer is wait. So 52% people say that yeah. you can yeah. try growth modulation. Yes. Yes. Yeah, try. You say try. Yes. Try. So I, 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 I went with the people. I, we, I added a remedial surgery of growth modulation. And uh, say, um, okay, Dr. Cho, how, what would you tell the parents that before you, you go ahead and do this surgery? With hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this surgery. But yeah, I would say that uh, to this surgery, but with this surgery, uh, I, I would say it's a half and half, whether you can correct the deformity or not. Yes, Dr. Wangshu, what, what would you tell me? Well, uh, first of all, the first surgery is technically very, very difficult. I would not offer osteotomy at the very beginning. I would try growth modulation if necessary. Because, well, um, it's very different from the distal femur. You have the anterior, anterior growth plate as well. So the osteotomy runs into risk of damaging the anterior facial plate. Or even when you're trying to remove the the, the facial bar, you could you could damage the anterior facial plate as well. I think that's so a very this, important point here. Yeah, this is technically very very demanding, and it's a very small kit. So, um, it's a good try. I, I would go for growth modulation, but I, I would just let the parents know that uh, we are just not sure whether this is going to work or not. Yeah. So this is immediate post op. That's uh, ten months down the line. That's three years down the line. And that's four and a half years down the line. But you can, as, as a pickup, I think, I don't know whether it is a plate which is placed posteriorly or what something, there is definitely a posterior depression. Or there's an angulation at the anterior TBL slope. So that's not okay. something correct here. So do you think the recovertum to do with the initial osteotomy or do you think to do plate? I, I, I don't know. Okay. But I think that, is, that is an issue still needs some uh, consideration later on. Can, can you go back to the early x-ray? The, the, the marker over the metaphysis actually is quite anterior, right? So, and if you look at the distance between the two markers and the, the, the tip of the two uh, 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 screws, actually the screws is opening more than the markers. So there is evidence of retarded growth anteriorly. So I think we have uh, solved one problem, but we still need to solve another one. Yeah, so, so see, you know, the, the flexion is not an issue. Here, there would be hyperextension, right? There is like a yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, you would have to deal with it because this is, even if you have a recovatum or a physal issue, like an anterior, like uh, Dr. Wang uh, Chow said, if you have a, a physal arrest, the anterior physal arrest, even if you have it pretty late, the effect is going to be dramatic. So it, it, to have this at a very early age, and you can already see the record on that. That is only going to increase in quite yes. a bit. So yes, yes. we're going to significant hyperextension as he as he walks. You know. Yeah. So I think this is. I, I completely agree that I have picked up. I have chosen this case because you know I want people to say there are a lot of complications and there are eighty seven percent, there's eighty three percent second grade as Dr. Chong as Dr. Chow has already said. Yeah. So I want to uh, be by just showing this case. It's not a simple job. And uh, you don't have to go ahead and do okay, very uh, fancy Prima, jobs. Yes. Sorry, sorry Prima, as your co-moderator, to remind you that my uh, Korean uh, faculty is uh, 12 yeah. to 9, 15 minutes for him. So I think. <laughs> yeah. So I think we'll we'll just take the last case, uh, and then I think we'll call it a day. Right? If uh, Dr. Cho allows us, we'll just take the last case. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this, is, um, this is a classical case of um, septic arthritis and uh, upper tibial osteomyelitis treated once by a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, uh, had recurrence of uh, uh, infection, 
uh, was sent to me by another pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And this is how uh, the MRI image is read, right? This was a recurrence or dumbbell-shaped transfacial abscess. And uh, so the, uh, so the culture, is it, a, is it a TB or a staph? No, it's a staph. It's a staph. Not a TB. No TB. No, we don't get neonatal tuberculosis that often. Why? Because I, I, I just had one, so that's why I'm asking you, yeah. Okay. No, but neonatal uh, tuberculosis is very uncommon. So let's start voting. What would you I do? I don't think it's that uncommon, Premal. We see it very often. <laughs> Not neonatal, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't see that often. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, I think you should wind up quickly because these are all non-trauma cases. You're getting into difficult areas now. Okay, okay. Yeah, but just show us, Premal, what happened. Yeah, just, what... just show us. Uh... Prima just show us the, the end, yeah. So basically, what I did was um, we just explored the wound, did debridement, and uh, I put a fat graft there. And that's a two-month follow-up. That's a seven-month follow-up. Uh, child couldn't come because of the lockdown, but this is his latest uh, uh, two-year follow-up. Yeah. See that there is no deformity and there's no limb land discrepancy. So I think. When you get an acute injury, I just put the case just to show that if you're expecting a physial graft, a physial bar formation in a very complicated injury of uh, physis, it may be a good idea to graft that area primarily so that theoretically there is a possibility of preventing a um, physial bar. Yashital, would you like to add uh, something on this prevention of physial bar in a very expected case? Because I think Dr. Peterson's uh, article also says that when they fix medial malleolus, they remove a small part of metaphyseal bone over the physis so that it uh, tends to prevent uh, physial bar. So, we so did he have an active infection when you, the, when you operate on him? Was it yes. an active infection? Yes. But you put the fat graft into the actively <laughs> infected <laughs> tissue. Yes. So isn't it dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> Primal, you're getting into controversies. Let's find out. It's okay, I think we better uh, close it, close out, close Not out. good messages. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think one message is there. Like, if you have a similar situation, a young trauma. Patient, uh, trauma. I think uh, I think doing an acute fat grafting is something that I I think uh, you know would be uh, acceptable. I mean, the other things, you know, I don't want to tell everyone, but uh, you might just read the paper and decide on your own about the fibrin glue part of it for acute physical injuries. When you're seeing the physis, when it's something is open, you're seeing the physis, what to do. I mean, whether you're going to be putting, uh, you know, fat graft on top of it or whether you're going to put some uh, fibrin glue on top of it. That's something that, that needs to be, like, you know, uh, researched upon. I'm not really sure what's the correct answer, but, um, but great cases. Okay. <laughs> So I think uh, I would like to thank uh, James and his team for uh, sharing beautiful uh, messages to us and participating in a great discussion. I think this is the best we could have done in the situation where we are. And okay, was... hey, uh, Tarao, you can show yourself. I, I'm taking a, a selfie and a wifi. Yes, for everyone. Good. <laughs> yes, Sandeep, you want to say something at the end and then we call it a day. The only thing I wanted to say was that uh, today is also the 14th uh, anniversary of, of one of our mentors, Dr. Joy Patankar, who was a pediatric orthopedic surgeon who passed away untimely on the same day. And uh, we would like to remember him because he had started this teaching programs in India. So we were doing iFix under Saraswati Foundation banner for quite some time. And uh, we would like to pay our homage to Dr. Joy Patankar. And we have his daughter, Nayanika, with us on the, the panel today. Uh, and she's studying to be a doctor. And uh, we all uh, pay our respects to Joy. And uh, Taral, handing over to you for some final words. Absolutely. So we are going to wind up now. It's uh, 8.52 in India and you know, almost close to midnight. Uh, uh, to our oh, it's not close. It's past midnight. Yeah, past midnight for <laughs> Korean. Past bit. For Korean. So, okay, so remember that. Yes. Absolutely. So we are ending now. Just a few announcements are that the quiz for session one and two together will be released on Monday and you have to appear by Thursday. So it has to be submitted by Thursday. So no quiz tonight. So you can have a peaceful sleep.
and tomorrow please join back at 6:15 pm again for a very interesting session on supracondylar fractures supracondylar please fractures please dream about supracondylar fractures tonight yeah yeah <laughs> So with David Skaggs and Charles Melman and Sheetal and uh, Sandeep and the entire team would be here for a very very interesting uh, talks and discussion on supracondylar fractures. So see you tomorrow. Bye. Okay, smile everyone. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good, night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you, everybody. Thank you, delegates. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.